Preface to Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. Preface fashion is a thing i care mighty little about except when it happens to run just exactly according to my own notion and i was mighty nigh sending out my book without any preface at all until a notion struck me that perhaps it was necessary to explain a little the reason why and wherefore i had written it most of authors seek fame but i seek for justice a holier impulse than ever entered into the ambitious struggles of the votaries of that fickle flirting goddess a publication has been made to the world which has done me much injustice and the catchpenny errors which it contains have been already too long sanctioned by my silence i don't know the author of the book and indeed i don't want to know him for after he has taken such a liberty with my name and made such an effort to hold me up to public ridicule he cannot calculate on anything but my displeasure if he had been content to have written his opinions about me however contemptuous they might have been i should have had less reason to complain but when he professes to give my narrative as he often does in my own language and then puts into my mouth such language as would disgrace even an outlandish african he must himself be sensible of the injustice he has done me and the trick he has played off on the public i have met with hundreds if not with thousands of people who have formed their opinions of my appearance habits language and everything else from that deceptive work they have almost in every instance expressed the most profound astonishment at finding me in human shape and with the countenance appearance and common feelings of a human being it is to correct all these false notions and to do justice to myself that I have written It is certain that the writer of the book alluded to has gathered up many imperfect scraps of information concerning me as in parts of his work There is some little semblance of truth But I ask him if this notice should ever reach his eye How would he have liked it if I have treated him so if I had put together such a bundle of ridiculous stuff and headed it with his name and sent it out upon the world without ever even condescending to ask his permission to these questions all upright men must give the same answer it was wrong and the desire to make money by it is no apology for such injustice to a fellow man but i let him pass as my wish is greatly more to vindicate myself than to condemn him in the following pages i have endeavoured to give the reader a plain honest homespun account of my state in life and some few of the difficulties which have attended me along its journey down to this time i am perfectly aware that i have related many small and as i fear uninteresting circumstances but if so my apology is that it was rendered necessary by a desire to link the different periods of my life together as they have passed from my childhood onward and thereby to enable the reader to select such parts of it as he may relish most if indeed there is anything in it which may suit his palate i have also been operated on by another consideration it is this i know that obscure as i am my name is making a considerable deal of fuss in the world i can't tell why it is nor in what it is to end go where i will everybody seems anxious to get a peep at me and it would be hard to tell which would have the advantage if i and the government and black hawk and a great eternal big caravan of wild varmints were all to be showed at the same time in four different parts of any of the big cities in the nation i am not so sure that i shouldn't get the most custom of any of the crew there must therefore be something in me or about me that attracts attention which is even mysterious to myself i can't understand it 
and I therefore put all the facts down, leaving the reader free to take his choice of them. On the subject of my style, it is bad enough, in all conscience, to please critics, if that is what they are after. They are a sort of vermin, though, that I shan't even so much as stop to brush off. If they want to work on my book, just let them go ahead, and after they are done, they had better blot out all their criticisms, than to know what opinion I would express of them, and by what sort of a curious name I would call them, if I was standing near them and looking over their shoulders. They will, at most, have only their trouble for their pay, but I rather expect I shall have them on my side. But I don't know of anything in my book to be criticised on by honourable men. Is it on my spelling? That's not my trade. Is it on my grammar? I hadn't time to learn it, and make no pretensions to it. Is it on the order and arrangement of my book? I never wrote one before, and never read very many, and, of course, know mighty little about that. Will it be on the authorship of the book? This I claim, and I'll hang on to it, like a wax plaster. The whole book is my own, and every sentiment and sentence in it. I would not be such a fool, or knave, either, as to deny that I have had it hastily run over by a friend or so, and that some little alterations have been made in the spelling and grammar, and I am not so sure that it is not the worse of even that. For I despise this way of spelling contrary to nature. And as for grammar, it's pretty much a thing of nothing at last, after all the fuss that's made about it. In some places I wouldn't suffer either the spelling or grammar or anything else to be touched, and therefore it will be found in my own way. But if anybody complains that I have had it looked over, I can only say to him, her or them, as the case may be, that while critics were learning grammar and learning to spell, I and Dr. Jackson, LLD, were fighting in the wars, and if our books and messages and proclamations and cabinet writings and so forth and so on should need a little looking over and a little correcting of the spelling and the grammar to make them fit for use, it's just nobody's business. Big men have far more important matters to attend to than crossing their T's and dotting their I's, and such like small things. But the government's name is to the proclamation, and my name's to the book, and if I didn't write the book, the government didn't write the proclamation, which no man dares to deny. But just read for yourself, and my ears for a heel-tap, if before you get through you don't say, with many a good-natured smile and hearty laugh, this is truly the very thing itself, the exact image of its author. David Crockett, Washington City, February 1st, 1834 End of Preface Chapter 1 of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, USA. Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. Chapter 1. As the public seem to feel some interest in the history of an individual, so humble as I am, and as that history can be so well known to no person living as to myself, I have, after so long a time, and under many pressing solicitations from my friends and acquaintances, at last determined to put my own hand to it and lay before the world a narrative on which they may at least rely as being true. And seeking no ornament or coloring for a plain, simple tale of truth, I throw aside all hypocritical and fawning apologies, and according to my own maxim, just go ahead. Where I am not known, I might perhaps gain some little credit by having thrown around this volume some of the flowers of learning. But where I am known, the vile cheatery would soon be detected, and like the foolish jackdaw that with a borrowed tail attempted to play the peacock, I should be justly robbed of my pilfered ornaments, and sent forth to strut 
without a tail for the balance of my time. I shall commence my book with what little I have learned of the history of my father, as all great men rest many, if not most, of their hopes on their noble ancestry. Mine was poor, but I hope honest, and even that is as much as many a man can say. But to my subject. My father's name was John Crockett, and he was of Irish descent. He was either born in Ireland or on a passage from that country to America across the Atlantic. He was by profession a farmer and spent the early part of his life in the state of Pennsylvania. The name of my mother was Rebecca Hawkins. She was an American woman, born in the state of Maryland between York and Baltimore. It is likely I may have heard where they were married, but if so, I have forgotten. It is, however, certain that they were, or else the public would never have been troubled with the history of David Crockett, their son. I have an imperfect recollection of the part which I have understood my father took in the Revolutionary War. I personally know nothing about it, for it happened to be a little before my day, and from himself and many others who were well acquainted with its troubles and afflictions, I have learned that he was a soldier in the Revolutionary War and took part in that bloody struggle. He fought, according to my information, in the battle at King's Mountain against the British and Tories, and in some other engagements of which my remembrance is too imperfect to enable me to speak with any certainty. At some time, though, I cannot say certainly when my father, as I have understood, lived in Lincoln County in the state of North Carolina. How long, I don't know. But when he removed from there, he settled in that district of country, which is now embraced in the East Division of Tennessee, though it was not then erected into a state. He settled there under dangerous circumstances, both to himself and his family, as the country was full of Indians, who were at that time very troublesome. By the Creeks, my grandfather and grandmother Crockett were both murdered, in their own house and on the very spot of ground where Rogersville, in Hawkins County, now stands. At the same time, the Indians wounded Joseph Crockett, a brother to my father, by a ball, which broke his arm, and took James a prisoner, who was still a younger brother than Joseph, and who, from natural defects, was less able to make his escape, as he was both deaf and dumb. He remained with them for seventeen years and nine months, when he was discovered and recollected by my father and his eldest brother, William Crockett, and was purchased by them from an Indian trader at a price which I do not now remember, but so it was that he was delivered up to them, and they returned him to his relatives. He now lives in Cumberland County in the state of Kentucky, though I have not seen him for many years. My father and mother had six sons and three daughters. I was the fifth son. What a pity I hadn't been the seventh, for then I might have been, by common consent, called doctor as a heap of people get to be great men. But like many of them, I stood no chance to become great in any other way than by accident, as my father was very poor and living as he did far back in the backwoods, he had neither the means nor the opportunity to give me or any of the rest of his children any learning. But before I get on the subject of my own troubles, and a great many very funny things that have happened to me. Like all other historians and biographers, I should not only inform the public that I was born, myself, as well as other folks, but that this important event took place, according to the best information I have received on the subject, on the 17th of August in the year 1786. Whether by day or night, I believe I never heard, but if I did, I have forgotten. I suppose, however, it is not very material to my present purpose, nor to the world, as the more important fact is well attested that I was born, and indeed it might be inferred from my present size and appearance that I was pretty well born, though I have never yet attached myself to that numerous and worthy society. 
At that time, my father lived at the mouth of Limestone on the Nolachucky River, and for the purpose not only of showing what sort of a man I now am, but also to show how soon I began to be a sort of a little man, I have endeavored to take the back track of life in order to fix on the first thing that I can remember. But even then, as now, so many things were happening that, as Major Jack Downing would say, they are all in a pretty considerable of a snarl, and I find it kinder hard to fix on that thing among them all which really happened first. But I think it likely I have hit on the outside line of my recollection as one thing happened at which I was so badly scared that it seems to me I could not have forgotten it if it had happened a little time only after I was born. Therefore, it furnishes me with no certain evidence of my age at the time, but I know one thing very well, and that is that when it happened, I had no knowledge of the use of breeches, for I had never had any nor worn any. But the circumstance was this. My four elder brothers and a well-grown boy of about 15 years old by the name of Campbell and myself were all playing on the river's side when all the rest of them got into my father's canoe and put out to amuse themselves on the water, leaving me on the shore alone. Just a little distance below them, there was a fall in the river, which went slap right straight down. My brothers, though they were little fellows, had been used to paddling the canoe and could have carried it safely anywhere about there, but this fellow Campbell wouldn't let them have the paddle, but fool-like undertook to manage it himself. I reckon he had never seen a watercraft before, and it went just any way but the way he wanted it. There he paddled and paddled and paddled, all the while going wrong, until, in a short time, here they were all going straight forward, stern foremost, right plump to the falls. And if they had only had a fair shake, they would have gone over as slick as a whistle. It wasn't this, though, that scared me, for I was so infernal mad that they had left me on the shore that I had as soon have seen them all go over the falls a bit as any other way. But their danger was seen by a man by the name of Kendall. But I'll be shot if it was Amos, for I believe I would know him yet if I was to see him. This man, Kendall, was working in a field on the bank, and knowing there was no time to lose, he started full tilt, and here he come like a cane break a fire. And as he ran, he threw off his coat, and then his jacket, and then his shirt, for I know when he got to the water, he had nothing on but his breeches. But seeing him in such a hurry, and tearing off his clothes as he went, I had no doubt but that the devil or something else was after him, and close on him, too, as he was running within an inch of his life. This alarmed me, and I screamed out like a young painter. But Kendall didn't stop for this. He went ahead with all might, and as full bent on saving the boys as Amos was on moving the deposits. When he came to the water, he plunged in, and where it was too deep to wade, he would swim, and where it was shallow enough, he went bolting on, and by such exertion as I never saw at any other time in my life, he reached the canoe when it was within twenty or thirty feet of the falls, and so great was the suck, and so swift the current, that poor Kendall had a hard time of it to stop them at last, as Amos will to stop the mouths of the people about his stock jobbing. But he hung on to the canoe till he got it stopped, and then drawed it out of danger. When they got out, I found the boys were more scared than I had been, and the only thing that comforted me was the belief that it was a punishment on them for leaving me on shore. Shortly after this, my father removed and settled in the same county, about ten miles above Greenville. There, another circumstance happened, which made a lasting impression on my memory, though I was but a small child. Joseph Hawkins, who was a brother to my mother, was in the woods hunting for deer. He was passing near a thicket of brush in which one of our neighbors was gathering some grapes, 
as it was in the fall of the year and the grape season. The body of the man was hid by the brush, and it was only as he would raise his hand to pull the bunches that any part of him could be seen. It was a likely place for deer, and my uncle, having no suspicion that it was any human being, but supposing the raising of the hand to be the occasional twitch of a deer's ear, fired at the lump, and as the devil would have it, unfortunately shot the man through the body. I saw my father draw a silk handkerchief through the bullet hole, and entirely through his body, yet after a while he got well, as little as any one would have thought it. What became of him, or whether he is dead or alive, I don't know, but I reckon he didn't fancy the business of gathering grapes in an out-of-the-way thicket soon again. The next move my father made was to the mouth of Cove Creek, where he and a man by the name of Thomas Galbraith undertook to build a mill in partnership. They went on very well with their work until it was nigh done, when there came the second epistle to Noah's Fresh, and away went their mill, shot, lock, and barrel. I remember the water rose so high that it got up into the house we lived in, and my father moved us out of it to keep us from being drowned. I was now about seven or eight years old and have a pretty distinct recollection of everything that was going on, from his bad luck in that business and being ready to wash out from mill building, my father again removed, and this time settled in Jefferson County, now in the state of Tennessee, where he opened a tavern on the road from Abingdon to Knoxville. His tavern was on a small scale, as he was poor, and the principal accommodations which he kept were for the wagoners, who traveled the road. Here I remained with him until I was twelve years old, and about that time you may guess if you belong to Yankee land, or reckon if like me you belong to the backwoods, that I began to make up my acquaintance with hard times, and a plenty of them. An old Dutchman by the name Jacob Seiler, who was moving from Knox County to Rockbridge in the state of Virginia, in passing made a stop at my father's house. He had a large stock of cattle that he was carrying on with him, and I suppose made some proposition to my father to hire someone to assist him. Being hard run every way, and having no thought, as I believe, that I was cut out for a congressman, or the like, young as I was, and as little as I knew about traveling, or being from home, he hired me to the old Dutchman to go four hundred miles on foot, with a perfect stranger that I never had seen until the evening before. I set out with a heavy heart, it is true, but I went ahead until we arrived at the place, which was three miles from what is called the Natural Bridge, and made a stop at the house of a Mr. Hartley, who was father-in-law to Mr. Seiler, who had hired me. My Dutch master was very kind to me and gave me five or six dollars, being pleased, as he said, with my services. This, however, I think was a bait for me, as he persuaded me to stay with him and not return any more to my father. I had been taught so many lessons of obedience by my father that I at first supposed I was bound to obey this man, or at least I was afraid openly to disobey him, and I therefore stayed with him and tried to put on a look of perfect contentment until I got the family all to believe I was fully satisfied. I had been there about four or five weeks when one day myself and two other boys were playing on the roadside some distance from the house. There came along three wagons, one belonged to an old man by the name of Dunn, and the others to two of his sons. They had each of them a good team and were all bound for Knoxville. They had been in the habit of stopping at my father's as they passed the road, and I knew them. I made myself known to the old gentleman and informed him of my situation. I expressed a wish to get back to my father and mother if they could fix any plan for me to do so, 
They told me that they would stay that night at a tavern seven miles from there, and that if I could get to them before day the next morning, they would take me home, and if I was pursued, they would protect me. This was a Sunday evening. I went back to the good old Dutchman's house, and as good fortune would have it, he and the family were out on a visit. I gathered my clothes and what little money I had and put them all together under the head of my bed. I went to bed early that night, but sleep seemed to be a stranger to me, for though I was a wild boy, yet I dearly loved my father and mother, and their images appeared to be so deeply fixed in my mind that I could not sleep for thinking of them. And then the fear that when I should attempt to go out, I should be discovered and called to a halt filled me with anxiety, and between my childish love of home, on the one hand, and the fears of which I have spoken, on the other, I felt mighty queer. But so it was, about three hours before day in the morning, I got up to make my start. When I got out, I found it was snowing fast, and that the snow was then on the ground about eight inches deep. I had not even the advantage of moonlight, and the whole sky was hidden by the falling snow, so that I had to guess at my way to the big road, which was about a half mile from the house. I, however, pursued ahead and soon got to it, and then pursued it in the direction to the wagons. I could not have pursued the road if I had not guided myself by the opening it made between the timber, as the snow was too deep to leave any part of it to be known by either seeing or feeling. Before I overtook the wagons, the earth was covered about as deep as my knees, and my tracks filled so briskly after me that by daylight my Dutch master could have seen no trace which I left. I got to the place about an hour before day. I found the wagoners already stirring and engaged in feeding and preparing their horses for a start. Mr. Dunn took me in and treated me with great kindness. My heart was more deeply impressed by meeting with such a friend and at such a time than by wading the snowstorm by night or all the other sufferings which my mind had endured. I warmed myself by the fire, for I was very cold, and after an early breakfast we set out on our journey. The thoughts of home now began to take the entire possession of my mind, and I almost numbered the sluggish turns of the wheels, and much more certainly the miles of our travel, which appeared to me to count mighty slow. I continued with my kind protectors until we got to the house of a Mr. John Cole on Roanoke, when my impatience became so great that I determined to set out on foot and go ahead by myself as I could travel twice as fast in that way as the wagons could. Mr. Dunn seemed very sorry to part with me and used many arguments to prevent me from leaving him. But home, poor as it was, again rushed on my memory, and it seemed ten times as dear to me as it ever had before. The reason was that my parents were there, and all that I had been accustomed to in the hours of childhood and infancy was there, and there my anxious little heart panted also to be. We remained at Mr. Cole's that night, and early in the morning I felt I couldn't stay, so taking leave of my friends, the wagoners, I went forward on foot until I was fortunately overtaken by a gentleman who was returning from market to which he had been with a drove of horses. He had a led horse with a bridle and saddle on him, and he kindly offered to let me get on his horse and ride him. I did so and was glad of the chance, for I was tired and was, moreover, near the first crossing of Roanoke, which I would have been compelled to wade, cold as the water was, if I had not fortunately met this good man. I traveled with him in this way without anything turning up worth recording until we got within fifteen miles of my father's house. There we parted, and he went on to Kentucky, and I trudged on homeward, which place I reached that evening. The name of this kind gentleman I have entirely forgotten, and I'm sorry for it, for it deserves a high place 
in my little book. A remembrance of his kindness to a little straggling boy and a stranger to him has, however, a resting place in my heart, and there it will remain as long as I live. End of chapter one. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, USA. Chapter 2 of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, USA. Having gotten home, as I have just related, I remained with my father until the next fall, at which time he took it into his head to send me to a little country school, which was kept in the neighborhood by a man whose name was Benjamin Kitchen, though I believe he was no way connected with the cabinet. I went four days and had just began to learn my letters a little when I had an unfortunate falling out with one of the scholars, a boy much larger and older than myself. I knew well enough that though the schoolhouse might do for a still hunt, it wouldn't do for a drive, and so I concluded to wait until I could get him out, and then I was determined to give him salt and vinegar. I waited till in the evening, and when the larger scholars were spelling, I slipped out, and going some distance along his road, I laid by the wayside in the bushes, waiting for him to come along. After a while, he and his company came on sure enough, and I pitched out from the bushes and set on him like a wildcat, I scratched his face all to a flitter jig, and soon made him cry out for quarters in good earnest. The fight being over, I went on home, and the next morning was started again to school. But do you think I went? No, indeed. I was very clear of it, for I expected the master would lick me up as bad as I had the boy. So, instead of going to the schoolhouse, I laid out in the woods all day until in the evening the scholars were dismissed and my brothers, who were also going to school, came along, returning home. I wanted to conceal this whole business from my father, and I therefore persuaded them not to tell on me, which they agreed to. Things went on this way for several days, I starting with them to school in the morning and returning with them in the evening, but lying out in the woods all day. At last, however, the master wrote a note to my father, inquiring why I was not sent to school. When he read this note, he called me up, and I knew very well that I was in a devil of a hobble, for my father had been taking a few horns and was in a good condition to make the fur fly. He called on me to know why I had not been at school. I told him I was afraid to go and that the master would whip me, for I knew quite well if I was turned over to this old kitchen, I should be cooked up to a crackling in little or no time. But I soon found that I was not to expect a much better fate at home, for my father told me, in a very angry manner, that he would whip me an eternal sight worse than the master, if I didn't start immediately to the school. I tried again to beg off, but nothing would do but to go to the school. Finding me rather too slow about starting, he gathered about a two-year-old hickory and broke after me, I put out with all my might, and soon we were both up to the top of our speed. We had a tolerable tough race for about a mile, but mind me, not on the schoolhouse road, for I was trying to get as far the other way as possible. And I yet believe if my father and the schoolmaster could both have levied on me about that time, I should never have been called on to sit in the councils of the nation, for I think they would have used me up. But, fortunately for me, about this time, I saw just before me a hill over which I made headway like a young steamboat. As soon as I had passed over it, I turned to one side and hid myself in the bushes. Here I waited until the old gentleman passed by, puffing and blowing as though his steam was high enough to burst his boilers. I waited until he gave up the hunt and passed back again. I then cut out and went to the house of an acquaintance a few miles off, who was just about to start with a drove. His name was Jesse Cheek, and I hired myself to go with him, determining not to return home, as home and the schoolhouse 
had both become too hot for me. I had an elder brother who also hired to go with the same drove. We set out and went on through Abingdon and the county seat of Wythe County in the state of Virginia, and then through Lynchburg by Orange Courthouse and Charlottesville, passing through what was called Chester Gap on to a town called Front Royal, where my employer sold out his drove to a man by the name of Van Meter, and I was started homeward again in company with a brother of the first owner of the drove, with one horse between us having left my brother to come on with the balance of the company. I traveled on with my new comrade about three days' journey, but much to his discredit, as I then thought and still think, he took care all the time to ride, but never to tie. At last I told him to go ahead, and I would come when I got ready. He gave me four dollars to bear my expenses upwards of four hundred miles, and then cut out and left me. I purchased some provisions and went on slowly, until at length I fell in with a wagoner, with whom I was disposed to scrape up a hasty acquaintance. I inquired where he lived and where he was going, and all about his affairs. He informed me that he lived in Greenville, Tennessee, and was on his way to a place called Gerardstown, 15 miles below Winchester. He also said that after he should make his journey to that place, he would immediately return to Tennessee. His name was Adam Myers, and a jolly good fellow he seemed to be. On a little reflection, I determined to turn back and go with him, which I did, and we journeyed on slowly, as wagons commonly do, but merrily enough. I often thought of home, and indeed wished bad enough to be there. But when I thought of the schoolhouse, and kitchen, my master, and the race with my father, and the big hickory he carried, and of the fierceness of the storm of wrath that I had left him in, I was afraid to venture back, for I knew my father's nature so well that I was certain his anger would hang on to him like a turkle does to a fisherman's toe, and that, if I went back in a hurry, he would give me the devil in three or four ways. But I and the wagoner had traveled two days, when we met my brother, who, I before stated, I had left behind when the drove was sold out. He persuaded me to go home, but I refused. He pressed me hard, and brought up a great many mighty strong arguments to induce me to turn back again. He pictured the pleasure of meeting my mother and my sisters, who all loved me dearly, and told me what uneasiness they had already suffered about me. I could not help shedding tears, which I did not often do, and my affections all pointed back to those dearest friends, and as I thought, nearly the only ones I had in the world. But then the promised whipping, that was the thing. It came right slap down on every thought of home, and I finally determined that make or break, hit or miss, I would just hang on to my journey and go ahead with the wagoner. My brother was much grieved at our parting, but he went his way, and so did I. We went on until at last we got to Gerardstown, where the wagoner tried to get a back load, but he could not without going to Alexandria. He engaged to go there, and I concluded that I would wait until he returned. I set in to work for a man by the name of John Gray at 25 cents per day. My labor, however, was light, in which I succeeded in pleasing the old man very well. I continued working for him until the wagoner got back, and for a good long time afterwards, as he continued to run his team back and forth, hauling to and from Baltimore. In the next spring, from the proceeds of my daily labor, small as it was, I was able to get me some decent clothes and concluded I would make a trip with the wagoner to Baltimore and see what sort of place that was and what sort of folks lived there. I gave him the balance of what money I had for safekeeping, which, as well as I recollect, was about seven dollars. We got on well enough until we came near Ellicott's Mills, our load consisting of flour in barrels. Here I got into the wagon for the purpose of changing my clothing, not thinking that I was in any danger, but while I was in there we were met by some wheelbarrow men who were working on the road, and the horses took a scare, and away they went like they had seen a ghost. 
They made a sudden wheel around and broke the wagon tongue slap short off as a pipe stem, and snap went both of the axle trees at the same time, and of all the devilish flouncing about of flour barrels that ever was seen. I reckon this took the beat. Even a rat would have stood a bad chance in a straight race among them, and not much better in a crooked one, for he would have been in a good way to be ground up as fine as ginger by their rolling over him. But this proved to me that if a fellow is born to be hung, he will never be drowned. And further, that if he is born for a seat in Congress, even flour barrels can't make a mash of him. All these dangers I escaped unhurt, though, like most of the office holders of these times, for a while I was afraid to say my soul was my own, for I didn't know how soon I should be knocked into a cocked hat and get my walking papers for another country. We put our load into another wagon and hauled ours to a workman's shop in Baltimore, having delivered the flour, and there we intended to remain two or three days, which time was necessary to repair the runaway wagon. While I was there, I went one day down to the wharf and was much delighted to see the big ships and their sails all flying, for I had never seen any such things before, and indeed I didn't believe there were any such things in all nature. After a short time, my curiosity induced me to step aboard of one where I was met by the captain who asked me if I didn't wish to take a voyage to London. I told him I did, for by this time I had become pretty well weaned from home, and I cared but little where I was, or where I went, or what became of me. He said he wanted just such a boy as I was, which I was glad to hear. I told him I would go and get my clothes and go with him. He inquired about my parents, where they lived, and all about them. I let him know that they lived in Tennessee, many hundred miles off. We soon agreed about my intended voyage, and I went back to my friend, the wagoner, and informed him that I was going to London, and wanted my money and my clothes. He refused to let me have either, and swore that he would confine me and take me back to Tennessee. I took it to heart very much, but he kept so close and constant a watch over me that I found it impossible to escape from him until he had started homeward and made several days' journey on the road. He was, during this time, very ill to me and threatened me with his wagon whip on several occasions. At length, I resolved to leave him at all hazards, and so before day, one morning, I got my clothes out of his wagon and cut out on foot without a farthing of money to bear my expenses. For all other friends, having failed, I determined then to throw myself on Providence and see how that would use me. I had gone, however, only a few miles when I came up with another wagoner, and such was my situation that I felt more than ever the necessity of endeavoring to find a friend. I therefore concluded I would seek for one in him. He was going westwardly and very kindly inquired of me where I was traveling. My youthful resolution, which had brooked almost everything else, rather gave way at this inquiry, for it brought the loneliness of my situation, and everything else that was calculated to oppress me directly to view. My first answer to his question was in a sprinkle of tears, for if the world had been given to me, I could not at that moment have helped crying, as soon as the storm of feeling was over. I told him how I had been treated by the wagoner, but a little before, who kept what little money I had, and left me without a copper to buy even a morsel of food. He became exceedingly angry and swore that he would make the other wagoner give up my money, pronouncing him a scoundrel and many other hard names. I told him I was afraid to see him, for he had threatened me with his wagon whip, and I believed he would injure me, but my new friend was a very large, stout-looking man, and as resolute as a tiger. He bid me not to be afraid, still swearing he would have my money or whip it out of the wretch who had it. We turned and went back about two miles when we reached the place where he was. I went reluctantly, but I depended on my friend for protection. When we got there, I had but little to say. But approaching the wagoner, my friend said to him, You damned rascal, you have treated this boy badly. To which he replied, It was my fault. He was then asked, if he did not get seven dollars of my money, which he confessed, 
it was then demanded of him, but he declared most solemnly that he had not that amount in the world, that he had spent my money and intended paying it back to me when we got to Tennessee. I then felt reconciled and persuaded my friend to let him alone, and we returned to his wagon, geared up, and started. His name I shall never forget while my memory lasts. It was Henry Myers. He lived in Pennsylvania, and I found him what he professed to be, a faithful friend and a clever fellow. We traveled together for several days, but at length I concluded to endeavor to make my way homeward, and for that purpose set out again on foot and alone. But one thing I must not omit. The last night I stayed with Mr. Myers was at a place where several other wagoners also stayed. He told them before we parted that I was a poor little straggling boy and how I had been treated and that I was without money though I had a long journey before me through a land of strangers where it was not even a wilderness. They were good enough to contribute a sort of money purse and presented me with three dollars. On this amount I traveled as far as Montgomery Courthouse in the state of Virginia where it gave out. I set in to work for a man by the name of James Caldwell a month for five dollars, which was about a shilling a day. When this time was out, I bound myself to a man by the name of Elijah Griffith, by trade a hatter, agreeing to work for him four years. I remained with him about 18 months when he found himself so involved in debt that he broke up and left the country. For this time I had received nothing and was, of course, left without money, and with but very few clothes, and them very indifferent ones. I, however, set in again and worked about as I could catch employment, until I got a little money and some clothing, and once more cut out for home. When I reached New River at the mouth of a small stream called Little River, the white caps were flying so that I couldn't get anybody to attempt to put me across. I argued the case as well as I could, but they told me there was great danger of being capsized and drowned if I attempted to cross. I told them if I could get a canoe, I would venture, caps or no caps. They tried to persuade me out of it, but finding they could not, they agreed I might take a canoe, and so I did and put off. I tied my clothes to the rope of the canoe to have them safe, whatever might happen but I found it a mighty ticklish business, I tell you, when I got out fairly on the river. I would have given the world if it had belonged to me to have been back on shore, but there was no time to lose now, so I just determined to do the best I could and the devil take the hindmost. I turned the canoe across the waves, to do which I had to turn it nearly up the river as the wind came from that way, and I went about two miles before I could land. When I struck land, my canoe was about half full of water, and I was as wet as a drowned rat. But I was so much rejoiced that I scarcely felt the cold, though my clothes were frozen on me, and in this situation I had to go above three miles before I could find any house or fire to warm at. I, however, made out to get to one at last, and then I thought I would warm the inside a little as well as the outside, and there might be no grumbling. So I took a little of the creeter, that warmer of the cold and cooler of the hot, and it made me feel so good, I concluded it was like the Negro's rabbit, good anyway. I passed on until I arrived in Sullivan County, in the state of Tennessee, and there I met with my brother, who had gone with me when I started from home with the cattle drove. I stayed with him a few weeks and then went on to my father's, which place I reached late in the evening. Several wagons were there for the night and considerable company about the house. I inquired if I could stay all night, for I did not intend to make myself known until I saw whether any of the family would find me out. I was told that I could stay and went in, but had mighty little to say to anybody. I had been gone so long and had grown so much that the family did not at first know me, and another, and perhaps a stronger reason, 
was they had no thought or expectation of me, for they all had long given me up for finally lost. After a while, we were all called to supper. I went with the rest. We had sat down to the table and begun to eat when my eldest sister recollected me. She sprung up, ran and seized me around the neck, and exclaimed, Here is my lost brother. My feelings at this time, it would be vain and foolish for me to attempt to describe. I had often thought I felt before, and I suppose I had, but sure I am, I never had felt as I then did. The joy of my sisters and my mother, and indeed of all the family, was such that it humbled me and made me sorry that I hadn't submitted to a hundred whippings sooner than cause so much affliction as they had suffered on my account. I found the family had never heard a word of me from the time my brother left me. I was now almost fifteen years old and my increased age and size, together with the joy of my father, occasioned by my unexpected return, I was sure would secure me against my long-dreaded whipping. And so they did. But it will be a source of astonishment to many who reflect that I am now a member of the American Congress, the most enlightened body of men in the world, that at so advanced an age, the age of fifteen, I did not know the first letter in the book. End of chapter two. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, USA. Chapter three of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Patch, Memphis, Tennessee. Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. Chapter 3. I had remained for some short time at home with my father when he informed me that he owed a man, whose name was Abraham Wilson, the sum of thirty-six dollars, and that if I would set in and work out the note so as to lift it for him, he would discharge me from his service, and I might go free. I agreed to do this, and went immediately to the man who held my father's note, and contracted with him to work six months for it. I set in, and worked with all my might, not losing a single day in the six months. When my time was out, I got my father's note, and then declined working with the man any longer, though he wanted to hire me mighty bad. Reason was, it was a place where a heap of bad company met to drink and gamble, and I wanted to get away from them, for I knowed very well if I stayed there I should get a bad name, as nobody could be respectable that would live there. I therefore returned to my father, and gave him up his paper, which seemed to please him mightily, for though he was poor, he was an honest man, and always tried mighty hard to pay off his debts. I next went to the house of an honest old Quaker by the name of John Kennedy, who had removed from North Carolina, and proposed to hire myself to him at two shillings a day. He agreed to take me a week on trial, at the end of which he appeared pleased with my work, and informed me that he held a note on my father for forty dollars, and that he would give me that note if I would work for him six months. I was certain enough that I should never get any part of the note, but then I remembered it was my father that owed it, and I concluded it was my duty as a child to help him along and ease his lot as much as I could. I told the Quaker I would take him up at his offer, and immediately went to work. I never visited my father's house during the whole time of this engagement, though he lived only fifteen miles off. But when it was finished, and I had got the note, I borrowed one of my employer's horses, and on a Sunday evening went to pay my parents a visit. Some time after I got there, I pulled out the note and handed it to my father, who supposed Mr. Kennedy had sent it for collection. The old man looked mighty sorry and said to me he had not the money to pay it and didn't know what he should do. I then told him I had paid it for him, and it was then his own, that it was not presented for collection, but as a present from me. At this, he shed a heap of tears, and as soon as he got a little over it, he said he was sorry he couldn't give me anything, but he was not able. He was too poor. 
The next day I went back to my old friend, the Quaker, and set in to work for him for some clothes. For I had now worked a year without getting any money at all, and my clothes were nearly all worn out, and what few I had left were mighty indifferent. I worked in this way for about two months, and in that time a young woman from North Carolina, who was the Quaker's niece, came on a visit to his house. And now I am just getting on a part of my history that I know I never can forget. For though I have heard people talk about heart loving, yet I reckon no poor devil in this world was ever cursed with such hard love as mine has always been when it came on me. I soon found myself head over heels in love with this girl, whose name the public could make no use of, and I thought that if all the hills about there were pure chink and all belonged to me, I would give them if I could just talk to her as I wanted to. But I was afraid to begin, for when I would think of saying anything to her, my heart would begin to flutter like a duck in a puddle. And if I tried to outdo it and speak, it would get right smack up in my throat and choke me like a cold potato. It bore on my mind in this way, till at last I concluded I must die if I didn't broach the subject. And so I determined to begin and hang on to trying to speak till my heart would get out of my throat one way or t'other. And so one day, at it I went. And after several trials, I could say a little. I told her how well I loved her, that she was the darling object of my soul and body, and I must have her, or else I should pine down to nothing and just die away with the consumption. I found my talk was not disagreeable to her, but she was an honest girl and didn't want to deceive nobody. She told me she was engaged to her cousin, the son of the old Quaker. This news was worse to me than war, pestilence, or famine, but still I knowed I could not help myself. I saw quick enough my cake was dough, and I tried to cool off as fast as possible, but I had hardly safety pipes enough, as my love was so hot as mighty not have burst my boilers. But I didn't press my claims any more, seeing there was no chance to do anything. I began now to think that all my misfortunes growed out of my want of learning. I had never been to school but four days, as the reader has already seen, and did not yet know a letter. I thought I would try to go to school some, and as the Quaker had a married son who was living about a mile and a half from him and keeping a school, I proposed to him that I would go to school four days in the week and work for him the other two to pay my board and schooling. He agreed I might come on those terms, and so at it I went, learning and working back and forwards until I had been with him nigh on to six months. In this time I learned to read a little in my primer, to write my own name, and to cipher some in the three first rules and figures, and this was all the schooling I ever had in my life up to this day. I should have continued longer if it hadn't been that I concluded I couldn't do any longer without a wife, and so I cut out to hunt me one. I found a family of very pretty little girls that I had known when very young. They had lived in the same neighborhood with me, and I had thought very well of them. I made an offer to one of them, whose name is nobody's business, no more than the Quaker girl's was, and I found she took it very well. I still continued paying my respects to her, until I got to love her as bad as I had the Quaker's niece, and I would have agreed to fight a whole regiment of wildcats if she would only have said she would have me. Several months passed in this way, during all of which time she continued very kind and friendly. At last, the son of the old Quaker and my first girl had concluded to bring their matter to a close, and my little queen and myself were called on to wait on them. We went on the day and performed our duty as attendants. This made me worse than ever, and after it was over, I pressed my claim very hard on her, but she would still give me a sort of an evasive answer. However, I gave her mighty little peace till she told me at last she would have me. I thought this was glorification enough, even without spectacles. I was then about eighteen years old. We fixed the time to be married, and I thought if that day come, I should be the happiest man in the created world or in the moon, or anywhere else. 
I had by this time got to be mighty fond of the rifle, and had bought a capital one. I most generally carried her with me wherever I went, and though I had got back to the old Quakers to live, who was a very particular man, I would sometimes slip out and attend the shooting matches where they shot for beef. I always tried, though, to keep it a secret from him. He had, at the same time, a bound boy living with him, who I had gotten into almost as great a notion of the girls as myself. He was about my own age, and was deeply smitten with the sister to my intended wife. I knowed it was in vain to try to get the leave of the old man for my young associate to go with me on any of my courting frolics, but I thought I could fix a plan to have him along, which would not injure the Quaker, as we had no notion that he should ever know it. We commonly slept upstairs, and at the gable end of the house there was a window. So one Sunday, when the old man and his family were all gone to meeting, we went out and cut a long pole, and taking it to the house, we set it up on end in the corner, reaching up the chimney as high as the window. After this, we would go upstairs to bed, and then, putting on our Sunday clothes, would go out at the window and climb down the pole, take a horse apiece, and ride about ten miles to where his sweetheart lived, and the girl I claimed as my wife. I was always mighty careful to be back before day, so as to escape being found out, and in this way I continued my attentions very closely until a few days before I was to be married, or at least thought I was, for I had no fear that anything was about to go wrong. Just now I heard of a shooting match in the neighborhood, right between where I lived and my girl's house, and I determined to kill two birds with one stone, to go to the shooting match first and then to see her. I therefore made the Quaker believe I was going to hunt for deer, as they were pretty plenty about in those parts, but instead of hunting them, I went straight on to the shooting match, where I joined in with a partner, and we put in several shots for the beef. I was mighty lucky, and when the match was over, I had won the whole beef. This was on a Saturday, and my success had put me in the finest humor in the world. So I sold my part of the beef for five dollars in the real grit, for I believe that was before banknotes was invented. At least, I had never heard of any. I now started on to ask for my wife, for though the next Thursday was our wedding day, I had never said a word to her parents about it. I had always dreaded the undertaking so bad that I had put the evil hour off as long as possible, and indeed I calculated they knowed me so well they wouldn't raise any objection to having me for their son-in-law. I had a great deal better opinion of myself, I found, than other people had of me. But I moved on with a light heart, and my five dollars jingling in my pocket, thinking all the time there was but few greater men in the world than myself. In this flow of good humor I went ahead, till I got within about two miles of the place, when I concluded I would stop a while at the house of the girl's uncle, where I might inquire about the family and so forth and so on. I was indeed just about ready to consider her uncle my uncle, and her affairs my affairs. When I went in, though, I found her sister there. I asked how all was at home. In a minute, I found from her countenance something was wrong. She looked mortified and didn't answer as quick as I thought she ought, being it was her brother-in-law talking to her. However, I asked her again. She then burst into tears and told me her sister was going to deceive me and that she was to be married to another man the next day. This was as sudden to me as a clap of thunder of a bright, sunshiny day. It was the capstone of all the afflictions I had ever met with, and it seemed to me that it was more than any human creature could endure. It struck me perfectly speechless for some time, and made me feel so weak that I thought I should sink down. I, however, recovered from my shock after a little, and rose and started without any ceremony or even bidding anybody goodbye. The young woman followed me out to the gate and entreated me to go on to her father's and said she would go with me. She said the young man, who was going to marry her sister, had got his license and had asked for her. But she assured me her father and mother both preferred me to him and that she had no doubt but that if I would go on, I could break off the match. But I found I could go no further. My heart was bruised, and my spirits were broken down. So I bid her farewell, 
and turned my lonesome and miserable steps back again homeward, concluding that I was only born for hardships, misery, and disappointment. I now began to think that in making me it was entirely forgotten to make my mate, that I was born odd, and should always remain so, and that nobody would have me. But all these reflections did not satisfy my mind, for I had no peace day nor night for several weeks. My appetite failed me, and I grew daily worse and worse. They all thought I was sick, and so I was, and it was the worst kind of sickness, a sickness of the heart and all the tender parts produced by disappointed love. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Patch, Memphis, Tennessee. Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. Chapter Four. I continued in this down-spirited situation for a good long time, until one day I took my rifle and started a-hunting. While out, I made a call at the house of a Dutch widow, who had a daughter that was well enough as to smartness, but she was as ugly as a stone fence. She was, however, quite talkative, and soon begun to laugh at me about my disappointment. She seemed disposed, though, to comfort me as much as she could, and for that purpose told me to keep in good heart, that there was as good fish in the sea as had ever been caught out of it. I doubted this very much, but whether or not, I was certain that she was not one of them, for she was so homely that it almost gave me a pain in the eyes to look at her. But I couldn't help thinking that she had intended what she had said as a banter for me to court her, the last thing in creation I could have thought of doing. I felt little inclined to talk on the subject, it is true, but to pass off the time I told her I thought I was born odd, and that no fellow to me could be found. She protested against this, and said if I would come to their reaping, which was not far off, she would show me one of the prettiest little girls there I had ever seen. She added that the one who had deceived me was nothing to be compared with her. I didn't believe a word of all this for I had thought that such a piece of flesh and blood as she was had never been manufactured, and never would again. I agreed with her, though, as the little varmint had treated me so bad that I ought to forget her, and yet I couldn't do it. I concluded the best way to accomplish it was to cut it out again and see if I could find any other that would answer me. So I told the Dutch girl I would be at the reaping, and would bring as many as I could with me. I employed my time pretty generally in giving information of it, as far as I could, until the day came. I now then offered to work for my old friend, the Quaker, two days if he would let his bound boy go with me one to the reaping. He refused, and reproved me pretty considerable roughly for my proposition, and said if he was in my place, he wouldn't go, that there would be a great deal of bad company there, and that I had been so good a boy he would be sorry for me to get a bad name. But I knowed my promise to the Dutch girl, and I was resolved to fulfill it. So I shouldered my rifle and started by myself. When I got to the place, I found a large company of men and women, and among them an old Irish woman who had a great deal to say. I soon found out from my Dutch girl that this old lady was the mother of the little girl she had promised me, though I had not yet seen her. She was in an outhouse with some other youngsters and had not yet made her appearance. Her mama, however, was no way bashful. She came up to me and began to praise my red cheeks and said she had a sweetheart for me. I had no doubt she had been told what I come for and all about it. In the evening I was introduced to her daughter. I must confess I was plaguy well pleased with her from the word go. She had a good countenance and was very pretty and I was full bent on making up an acquaintance with her. It was not long before the dancing commenced, and I asked her to join me in a reel. 
she very readily consented to do so, and after we had finished our dance, I took a seat alongside of her and entered into a talk. I found her very interesting. While I was sitting by her, making as good a use of my time as I could, her mother came to us and very jocularly called me her son-in-law. This rather confused me, but I looked on it as a joke of the old lady and tried to turn it off as well as I could. But I took care to pay as much attention to her through the evening as I could. I went on the old saying of salting the cow to catch the calf. I soon become so much pleased with this little girl that I began to think the Dutch girl had told me the truth when she said there were still good fish in the sea. We continued our frolic till near day when we joined in some plays calculated to amuse youngsters. I had not often spent a more agreeable night. In the morning, however, we all had to part, and I found my mind had become much better reconciled than it had been for a long time. I went home to the Quakers and made a bargain to work with his son for a low-priced horse. He was the first one I'd ever owned, and I was to work six months for him. I had been engaged very closely five or six weeks when this little girl run in my mind so that I concluded I must go and see her and find out what sort of people they were at home. I mounted my horse and away I went to where she lived, and when I got there I found her father a very clever old man, and the old woman as talkative as ever. She wanted badly to find out all about me, and as I thought, to see how I would do for her girl. I had not yet seen her about, and I began to feel some anxiety to know where she was. In a short time, however, my impatience was relieved as she arrived at home from a meeting to which she had been. There was a young man with her, who I soon found was disposed to set up claim to her, as he was so attentive to her that I could hardly get to slip in a word edgeways. I began to think I was barking up the wrong tree again, but I was determined to stand up to my rack, fodder or no fodder. And so to know her mind a little on the subject, I began to talk about starting, as I knowed she would then show some sign from which I could understand which way the wind blowed. It was then near night, and my distance was fifteen miles home. At this, my little girl soon began to indicate to the other gentleman that his room would be the better part of his company. At length, she left him and came to me and insisted mighty hard that I should not go that evening. And indeed, from all her actions and the attempt she made to get rid of him, I saw that she preferred me all holler. But it wasn't long before I found trouble enough in another quarter. Her mother was deeply enlisted for my rival, and I had to fight against her influence as well as his. But the girl herself was the prize I was fighting for, and as she welcomed me, I was determined to lay siege to her, let what would happen. I commenced a close courtship, having cornered her from her old bow, while he set off looking on like a poor man at a country frolic, and all the time almost gritting his teeth with pure disappointment. But he didn't dare to attempt anything more, for now I had gotten a start and I looked at him every once in a while as fierce as a wildcat. I stayed with her until Monday morning, and then I put out for home. It was about two weeks after this that I was sent for to engage in a wolf hunt, where a great number of men were to meet with their dogs and guns, and where the best sort of sport was expected. I went as large as life, but I had to hunt in strange woods and in a part of the country which was very thinly inhabited. While I was out, it clouded up, and I began to get scared, and in a little while I was so much so that I didn't know which way home was, nor anything about it. I set out the way I thought it was, but it turned out with me, as it always does with a lost man, I was wrong, and took exactly the contrary direction from the right one. And for the information to young hunters, I will just say in this place that whenever a fella gets bad lost, the way home is just the way he don't think it is. This rule will hit nine times out of ten. I went ahead, though, about six or seven miles, when I found night was coming on fast. But at this distressing time, I saw a little woman streaking it along through the woods like all wrath. So I cut on, too, for I was determined I wouldn't lose sight of her that night any more. I run on till she saw me, and she stopped, for she was as glad to see me as I was to see her, as she was lost as well as me. When I came up to her, 
who should she be but my little girl that I had been paying my respects to. She had been out hunting her father's horses and had missed her way and had no knowledge where she was or how far it was to any house or what way would take us there. She had been traveling all day and was mighty tired. And I would have taken her up and toted her if it hadn't been that I wanted her just where I could see her all the time. For I thought she looked sweeter than sugar, and by this time I loved her almost well enough to eat her. At last I came to a path that I knowed must go somewhere, and so we followed it till we came to a house at about dark. Here we stayed all night. I sat up all night, Corden, and in the morning we parted. She went to her home from which we were distant about seven miles and out of mine, which was ten miles off. I now turned in to work again, and it was about four weeks before I went back to see her. I continued to go occasionally until I had worked long enough to pay for my horse by putting in my gun with my work to the man I had purchased from, and then I began to count whether I was to be deceived again or not. At our next meeting, we set the day for our wedding, and I went to my father's and made arrangements for an infair, and returned to ask her parents for her. When I got there, the old lady appeared to be mighty wrathy, and when I broached the subject, she looked at me as savage as a meat axe. The old man appeared quite willing and treated me very clever, but I hadn't been there long before the old woman as good as ordered me out of her house. I thought I would put her in mind of old times and see how that would go with her. I told her she had called me her son-in-law before I had attempted to call her my mother-in-law, and I thought she ought to cool off. But her Irish was up too high to do anything with her, so I quit trying. All I cared for was to have her daughter on my side, which I knowed was the case then. But how soon some other fellow might knock my nose out of joint again, I couldn't tell. I, however, felt rather insulted at the old lady, and I thought I wouldn't get married in her house. And so I told her girl that I would come the next Thursday and bring a horse, bridle, and saddle for her, and she must be ready to go. Her mother declared I shouldn't have her, but I knowed I should, if somebody else didn't get her before Thursday. I then started, bidding them good day, and went by the house of a justice of the peace, who lived on the way to my father's, and made a bargain with him to marry me. When Thursday came, all necessary arrangements were made at my father's to receive my wife, and so I took my eldest brother and his wife and another brother and a single sister that I had and two other young men with me and cut out to her father's house to get her. We went on until we got within two miles of the place where we met a large company that had heard of the wedding and were waiting. Some of that company went on with my brother and sister and the young man I had picked out to wait on me. When they got there, they found the old lady as wrathy as ever. However, the old man filled their bottle, and the young men returned in a hurry. I then went on with my company, and when I arrived, I never pretended to dismount from my horse, but rode up to the door and asked the girl if she was ready, and she said she was. I then told her to light on the horse I was leading, and she did so. Her father, though, had gone out to the gate, and when I started, he commenced persuading me to stay and marry there that he was entirely willing to the match, and that his wife, like most women, had entirely too much tongue, but that I oughtn't to mind her. I told him if she would ask me to stay and marry at her house, I would do so. With that, he sent for her, and after they had talked for some time out by themselves, she came to me and looked at me mighty good, and asked my pardon for what she had said, and invited me stay. She said it was the first child she had ever had to marry, and she couldn't bear to see her go off in that way, that if I would light, she would do the best she could for us. I couldn't stand everything, and so I agreed, and we got down and went in. I sent off then for my parson, and got married in a short time, for I was afraid to wait long for fear of another defeat. We had as good treatment as could be expected, and that night all went on well. The next day we cut out from my father's, where we met a large company of people, that had been waiting a day and a night for our arrival. We passed the time quite merrily, till the company broke up, and having gotten my wife, I thought I was completely made up, and needed nothing more in the whole world. But I soon found this was all a mistake, for now having a wife, I wanted everything else, and worse than all, I had nothing to give for it. 
I remained a few days at my father's and then went back to my new father-in-law's, where, to my surprise, I found my old Irish mother in the finest humor in the world. She gave us two likely cows and calves, which, though it was a small marriage portion, was still better than I'd expected, and indeed it was about all I ever got. I rented a small farm and cabin and went to work, but I had much trouble to find out a plan to get anything to put in my house. At this time, my good old friend the Quaker came forward to my assistance and gave me an order to a store for $15 worth of such things as my little wife might choose. With this, we fixed up pretty grand, as we thought, and allowed to get on very well. My wife had a good wheel and knew exactly how to use it. She was also a good weaver, as most of the Irish are, whether men or women, and being very industrious with her wheel, she had little or no time of fine web of cloth ready to make up, and she was good at that too, and at almost anything else that a woman could do. We worked on for some years, renting ground and paying high rent until I found it wasn't the thing it was cracked up to be and that I couldn't make a fortune at it just at all. So I concluded to quit it and cut out for some new country. In this time we had two sons and I found I was better at increasing my family than my fortune. It was therefore the more necessary that I should hunt some better place to get along. And as I knowed I would have to move at some time, I thought it was better to do it before my family got too large that I might have left to carry. The Duck and Elk River country was just beginning to settle, and I determined to try that. I had now one old horse and a couple of two-year-old colts. They were both broke to the halter, and my father-in-law proposed that if I went, he would go with me and take one horse to help me move. So we all fixed up, and I packed my two colts with as many of my things as they could bear, and away we went across the mountains. We got on well enough and arrived safely in Lincoln County, on the head of the Mulberry Fork of Elk River. I found this a very rich country and so new that game of different sorts was very plenty. It was here that I began to distinguish myself as a hunter and to lay the foundation for all my future greatness. But my little did I know of what sort it was going to be. Of deer and smaller game, I killed abundance, but the bear had been much hunted in those parts before and were not so plenty as I could have wished. I lived here in the years 1809 and 10, to the best of my recollection, and then I moved to Franklin County and settled on Beans Creek, where I remained till after the close of the last war. End of chapter 4、Chapter、five of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Hastings. I was living ten miles below Winchester when the Creek War commenced, and as military men are making so much fuss in the world at this time, I must give an account of the part I took in the defense of the country. If it should make me president, why, I can't help it. Such things will sometimes happen, and my pluck is never to seek nor decline office. It is true I had a little rather not. But yet, if the government can't get on without taking another president from Tennessee to finish the work of retrenchment and reform, why then I reckon I must go in for it. But I must begin about the war, and leave the other matter for the people to begin on. The Creek Indians had commenced their open hostilities by a most bloody butchery at Fort Mims. There had been no war among us for so long that but few who were not too old to bear arms knew anything about the business. I, for one, had often thought about war, and had often heard it described. And I did verily believe in my own mind that I couldn't fight in that way at all. But my after experience convinced me that this was all a notion. For when I heard of the mischief which was done at the fort, I instantly felt like going, and I had none of the dread of dying I expected to feel. In a few days, a general meeting of the militia was called for the purpose of raising volunteers. And when the day arrived for that meeting, my wife, who had heard me say I meant to go to the war, began to beg me not to turn out. She said she was a stranger in the parts where we lived. Had no connections living near her, and that she and our little children would be left in a lonesome and unhappy situation if I went away. It was mighty hard to go against such arguments as these, but my countrymen had been murdered, and I knew that the next thing would be that the Indians would be scalping the women and children all about there if we didn't put a stop to it. I reasoned the case with her as well as I could, and told her that if every man would wait till his wife got willing for him to go to war, there would be no fighting done until we would all be killed in our own houses. That I was as able to go as any man in the world, and that I believed it was a duty I owed to my country. 
Whether she was satisfied with this reasoning or not, she did not tell me. But seeing I was bent on it, all she did was to cry a little and turn about to her work. The truth is, my dander was up, and nothing but war could bring it right again. I went to Winchester, where the muster was to be, and a great many people had collected, for there was as much fuss among the people about the war as there is now about moving the depot sites. When the men were paraded, a lawyer by the name of Jones addressed us, and closed by turning out himself, and inquiring, at the same time, who among us felt like we could fight the Indians. This was the same Mr. Jones who afterwards served in Congress, from the state of Tennessee. He informed us he wished to raise a company, and that then the men should meet and elect their own officers. I believe I was about the second or third man that stepped out, but on marching up and down the regiment a few times, we found we had a large company. We volunteered for sixty days, as it was supposed our services would not be longer wanted. A day or two after this we met, and elected Mr. Jones our captain, and also elected our other officers. We then received orders to start on the next Monday week, before which time I had fixed as well as I could to go, and my wife had equipped me as well as she was able for the camp. The time arrived. I took a parting farewell of my wife and my little boys, mounted my horse, and set sail to join my company. Expecting to be gone only a short time, I took no more clothing with me than I supposed would be necessary, so that if I got into an Indian battle I might not be pestered with any unnecessary plunder to prevent my having a fair shake with them. We all met, and went ahead till we passed Huntsville, and camped at a large spring called Bee's Spring. Here we stayed for several days, in which time the troops began to collect from all quarters. At last we mustered about thirteen hundred strong, all mounted volunteers, and all determined to fight, judging from myself, for I felt wolfish all over. I verily believe the whole army was of the real grit. Our captain didn't want any other sort, and to try them, he several times told his men that if any of them wanted to go back home, they might do so at any time before they were regularly mustered into the service. But he had the honor to command all his men from first to last, as not one of them left him. General Jackson had not yet left Nashville with his old foot volunteers that had gone with him to Natchez in 1812, the year before. While we remained at the spring, a Major Gibson came and wanted some volunteers to go with him across the Tennessee River and into the Creek Nation to find out the movements of the Indians. He came to my captain and asked for two of his best woodsmen, and such as were best with a rifle. The captain pointed me out to him, and said that he would be security that I would go as far as the Major would himself, or any other man. I willingly engaged to go with him, and asked him to let me choose my own mate to go with me, which he said I might do. I chose a young man by the name of George Russell, a son of old Major Russell of Tennessee. I called him up, but Major Gibson said he thought he hadn't beard enough to please him. He wanted men and not boys. I must confess I was a little nettled at this, for I know George Russell, and I know there was no mistake in him, and I didn't think the courage ought to be measured by the beard, for fear a goat would have the preference over a man. I told the Major he was on the wrong scent, that Russell could go as far as he could, and I must have him along. He saw I was a little wrathy, and said I had the best chance of knowing, and agreed that it should be as I wanted it. He told us to be ready early in the morning for a start, and so we were. We took our camp equipage, mounted our horses, and thirteen in number, including the Major, we cut out. We went on and crossed the Tennessee River at a place called Ditto's Landing, and then traveled about seven miles further and took up camp for the night. Here a man by the name of John Haynes overtook us. He had been an Indian trader in that part of the nation, and was well acquainted with it. He went with us as a pilot. The next morning, however, Major Gibson and myself concluded we should separate and take different directions to see what discoveries we could make. So he took seven of the men, and I five, making thirteen in all, including myself. He was to go by the house of a Cherokee Indian named Dick Brown, and I was to go by Dick's father's and getting all the information we could, we were to meet that evening where the roads came together, fifteen miles the other side of Brown's. At old Mr. Brown's I got a half-blood Cherokee to agree to go with me, whose name was Jack Thompson. He was not then ready to start, but was to fix that evening and overtake us at the Fork Road where I was to meet Major Gibson. I knowed it wouldn't be safe to camp right at the road, and so I told Jack that when he got to the Fork he must holler like an owl, and I would answer him in the same way for I knowed it would be night before he got there. I and my men then started and went on to the place of meeting, but Major Gibson was not there. We waited till almost dark, but still he didn't come. We then left the Indian trace a little distance, and, turning into the head of a hollow, we struck up camp. It was about ten o'clock at night when I heard my owl, and I answered him. Jack soon found us, and we determined to rest there during the night. We stayed also the next morning till after breakfast, but in vain, for the Major still didn't come. 
I told the men we had set out to hunt a fight, and I wouldn't go back in that way, that we must go ahead and see what the red men were at. We started, and went to a Cherokee town about twenty miles off, and after a short stay there we pushed on to the house of a man by the name of Radcliffe. He was a white man, but had married a Creek woman, and lived just in the edge of the Creek Nation. He had two sons, large, likely fellows, and a great deal of potatoes and corn, and indeed almost everything else to go on. So we fed our horses and got dinner with him, and seemed to be doing mighty well, but he was bad scared all the time. He told us there had been ten painted warriors at his house only an hour before, and if we were discovered there they would kill us and his family with us. I replied to him that my business was to hunt for just such fellows as he had described, and I was determined not to go back until I had done it. Our dinner being over, we saddled up our horses and made ready to start, but some of my small company, I found, were disposed to return. I told them if we were to go back then we should never hear the last of it, and I was determined to go ahead. I knowed some of them would go with me, and that the rest were afraid to go back by themselves, and so we pushed on to the camp of some of the friendly creeks which was distant about eight miles. The moon was about the full, and the night was clear. We therefore had the benefit of her light from night to morning, and I knew if we were placed in such danger as to make a retreat necessary, we could travel by night as well as in the daytime. We had not gone very far when we met two negroes, well mounted on Indian ponies, and each with a good rifle. They had been taken from their owners by the Indians, and were running away from them and trying to get back to their masters again. They were brothers, both very large and likely, and could talk Indian as well as English. One of them I sent on to Ditto's Landing, the other I took back with me. It was after dark when we got to the camp, where we found about forty men, women, and children. They had bows and arrows, and I turned into shooting with their boys by a pine light. In this way we amused ourselves very well for a while. But at last the negro, who had been talking to the Indians, came to me and told me they were very much alarmed, for the Red Sticks, as they called the war party of the Creeks, would come and find us there, and if so, we should all be killed. I directed him to tell them that I would watch, and if one would come that night, I would carry the skin of his head home to make me a moccasin. When he made this communication, the Indians laughed aloud. At about ten o'clock at night, we all concluded to try to sleep a little, but that our horses might be ready for use, as the treasurer said of the drafts on the United States Bank, on certain contingencies, we tied them up with our saddles on them and everything to our hand, if in the night our quarters should get uncomfortable. We lay down with our guns in our arms, and I had just gotten into a dose of sleep when I heard the sharpest scream that ever escaped the throat of a human creature. It was more like a wrathy painter than anything else. The negro understood it, and he sprang to me, for though I heard the noise well enough, yet I wasn't wide awake enough to get up. So the negro caught me and said the red sticks was coming. I rose quicker then, and asked what was the matter. Our negro had gone and talked with the Indian who had just fetched the scream, as he came into camp, and learned from him that the war party had been crossing the Coosa River all day at the Ten Islands, and were going on to meet Jackson, and this Indian had come as a runner. This news very much alarmed the friendly Indians in camp, and they were all off in a few minutes. I felt bound to make this intelligence known as soon as possible to the army we had left at the landing, and so we all mounted our horses and put out in a long lope to make our way back to that place. We were about sixty-five miles off. We went on to the same Cherokee town we had visited on our way out, having first called at Radcliffe's, who was off with his family, and at the town we found large fires burning, but not a single Indian was to be seen. They were all gone. These circumstances were calculated to lay our dander a little, as it appeared we must be in great danger, though we could easily have licked any force if not more than five to one. But we expected the whole nation would be on us, and against such fearful odds we were not so rampant for a fight. We therefore stayed only a short time in the light of the fires about the town, preferring the light of the moon and the shade of the woods. We pushed on till we got again to old Mr. Brown's, which was still about thirty miles from where we had left the main army. When we got there, the chickens were just at the first crowing for day. We fed our horses, got a morsel to eat ourselves, and again cut out. About ten o'clock in the morning we reached the camp, and I reported to Colonel Coffee the news. He didn't seem to mind my report a bit, and this raised my dander higher than ever, but I knowed I had to be on my best behavior, and so I kept it all to myself, though I was so mad I was burning inside like a tar kiln, and I wondered that the smoke hadn't been pouring out of me at all points. Major Gibson hadn't yet returned, and we all began to think he was killed, and that night they put out a double guard. The next day the Major got in, and brought a worse tale than I had, though he stated the same facts so far as I went. This seemed to put our Colonel all in a fidget, and it convinced me clearly of one of the hateful ways of the world. When I made my report, it wasn't believed, because I was no officer. I was no great man, but just a poor soldier. 
But when the same thing was reported by Major Gibson, why then it was all as true as preaching, and the colonel believed it every word. He therefore ordered breastworks to be thrown up, near a quarter of a mile long, and sent an express to Fayetteville, where General Jackson and his troops was, requesting them to push on like the very mischief, for fear we should all be cooked up to a crackling before they could get there. Old Hickory Face made a forced march on getting the news, and on the next day he and his men got into camp, with their feet all blistered from the effects of their swift journey. The volunteers, therefore, stood guard altogether to let them rest. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Polka. Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. Chapter Six. About eight hundred of the volunteers, and of that number I was one, were now sent back, crossing the Tennessee River, and on through Huntsville, so as to cross the river again at another place, and to get on the Indians in another direction. After we passed Huntsville, we struck on the river at the Muscle Shoals, and at a place on them called Melton's Bluff. This river is here about two miles wide, and a rough bottom so much so indeed in many places as to be dangerous and in fording it this time we left several of the horses belonging to our men with their feet fast in the crevices of the rocks the men whose horses were thus left went ahead on foot we pushed on till we got to what was called the black warrior's town which stood near the very spot where tuscaloosa now stands which is the seat of government for the state of alabama this indian town was a large one but when we arrived we found the indians had all left it there was a large field of corn standing out and a pretty good supply in some cribs there was also a fine quantity of dried beans which were very acceptable to us and without delay we secured them as well as the corn and then burned the town to ashes after which we left the place in the field where we gathered the corn we saw plenty of fresh indian tracks and we had no doubt they had been scared off by our arrival we then went on to meet the main army at the fork road where i was first to have met major gibson we got that evening as far back as the encampment we had made the night before we reached the black warriors town which we had just destroyed the next day we were entirely out of meat I went to Colonel Coffey, who was then in command of us, and asked his leave to hunt as we marched. He gave me leave, but told me to take mighty good care of myself. I turned aside to hunt, and had not gone far when I found a deer that had just been killed and skinned, and his flesh was still warm and smoking. From this I was sure that the Indian who had killed it had been gone only a very few minutes, and though I was never much in favor of one hunter stealing from another, yet meat was so scarce in camp that I thought I must go in for it. So I just took up the deer on my horse before me and carried it on till night. I could have sold it for almost any price I would have asked, but this wasn't my rule, neither in peace nor war. Whenever I had anything and saw a fellow being suffering, I was more anxious to relieve him than to benefit myself. And this is one of the true secrets of my being a poor man to this day. But it is my way, and while it has often left me with an empty purse, which is as near the devil as anything else I have seen, yet it has never left my heart empty of consolations which money couldn't buy the consolations of having sometimes fed the hungry and covered the naked. I gave all my deer away, except a small part I kept for myself, and just sufficient to make a good supper for my mess, for meat was getting to be a rarity to us all. We had to live mostly on parched corn. The next day we marched on, and at night took up camp near a large cane break. While here, I told my mess I would again try for some meat, 
so I took my rifle and cut out, but hadn't gone far when I discovered a large gang of hogs. I shot one of them down in his tracks, and the rest broke directly toward the camp. In a few minutes the guns began to roar, as bad as if the whole army had been in an Indian battle and the hogs to squeal as bad as the pig did when the devil turned barber. I shouldered my hog and went on to the camp, and when I got there I found they had killed a good many of the hogs, and a fine fat cow into the bargain that had broke out of the cane break. We did very well that night, and the next morning marched on to a Cherokee town where our officers stopped and gave the inhabitants an order on Uncle Sam for their cow and the hogs we had killed. The next day we met the main army, having had, as we thought, hard times and a plenty of them, though we had yet seen hardly the beginning of trouble. After our meeting we went on to Radcliffe's, where I had been before, while out as a spy and when we got there we found he had hid all his provisions. We also got into the secret that he was the very rascal who had sent the runner to the Indian camp with the news that the Red Sticks were crossing at the Ten Islands, and that his object was to scare me and my men away, and send us back with a false alarm. To make some atonement for this, we took the old scoundrel's two big sons with us and made them serve in the war. We then marched to a place which we called Camp Wills, and here it was that Captain Cannon was promoted to a colonel, and Colonel Coffey to a general. We then marched to the Ten Islands on the Coosa River, where we established a fort, and our spy companies were sent out. They soon made prisoners of Bob Catala and his warriors, and in a few days afterwards we heard of some Indians in a town about eight miles off. So we mounted our horses and put out for that town, under the direction of two friendly creeks we had taken for pilots. We also had a Cherokee colonel, Dick Brown, and some of his men with us. When we got near the town we divided, one of our pilots going with each division, and so we passed on each side of the town, keeping near to it, until our lines met on the far side. We then closed up at both ends so as to surround it completely, and then we sent Captain Hammond's company of rangers to bring on the affray. He had advanced near the town when the Indians saw him, and they raised the yell and came running at him like so many red devils. The main army was now formed in a hollow square around the town, and they pursued Hammond till they came in reach of us. We then gave them a fire, and they returned it, and then ran back into their town. We began to close on the town by making our files closer and closer, and the Indians soon saw that they were our property, so most of them wanted us to take them prisoners, and their squaws and all would run and take hold of any of us they could, and give themselves up. I saw seven squaws have hold of one man, which made me think of the scriptures. So I hollered out, the scriptures was fulfilling, that there was seven women holding to one man's coattail but I believe it was a hunting shirt all the time. We took them all prisoners that came out to us in this way, but I saw some warriors run into a house until I counted forty-six of them. We pursued them until we got near the house, when we saw a squaw sitting in the door, and she placed her feet against the bow she had in her hand, and then took an arrow, and raising her feet, she drew with all her might and let fly at us, and she killed a man whose name I believe was Moore. He was a lieutenant, and his death so enraged us all that she was fired on, and had at least twenty balls blown through her. This was the first man I ever saw killed with a bow and arrow. We now shot them like dogs, and then set the house on fire, and burned it up with the forty-six warriors in it. I recollect seeing a boy who was shot down near the house. His arm and thigh was broken and he was so near the burning house that the grease was stewing out of him. In this situation he was still trying to crawl along, but not a murmur escaped him, though he was only about twelve years old. So sullen is the Indian when his dander is up, that he had sooner die than make a noise or ask for quarters. The number that we took prisoners, being added to the number we killed, amounted to one hundred and eighty-six, though I don't remember the exact number of either. 
we had five of our men killed. We then returned to our camp, at which our fort was erected, and known by the name of Fort Strother. No provisions had yet reached us, and we had now been for several days on half rations. However, we went back to our Indian town on the next day, when many of the carcasses of the Indians were still to be seen. They looked very awful, for the burning had not entirely consumed them, but given them a very terrible appearance, at least what remained of them. It was somehow or other found out that the house had a potato cellar under it, and an immediate examination was made, for we were all as hungry as wolves. We found a fine chance of potatoes in it, and hunger compelled us to eat them, though I had a little rather not, if I could have helped it, for the oil of the Indians we had burned up on the day before had run down on them, and they looked like they had been stewed with fat meat. We then again returned to the army, and remained there for several days, almost starving, as all our beef was gone. We commenced eating the beef hides, and continued to eat every scrap we could lay our hands on. At length, an Indian came to our guard one night, and hollered, and said he wanted to see Captain Jackson. He was conducted to the General's marquee, into which he entered, and in a few minutes we received orders to prepare for marching. In an hour we were all ready, and took up the line of march. We crossed the Coosa River, and went on in the direction to Fort Talladega, when we arrived near the place, we met eleven hundred painted warriors, the very choice of the Creek Nation. They had encamped near the fort, and had informed the friendly Indians who were in it that if they didn't come out and fight with them against the whites, they would take their fort and all their ammunition and provision. The friendly party asked three days to consider of it, and agreed that if on the third day they didn't come out ready to fight with them, they might take their fort. Thus they put them off. They then immediately started their runner to General Jackson, and he and the army pushed over, as I have just before stated. The camp of warriors had their spies out, and discovered us coming some time before we got to the fort. They then went to the friendly Indians and told them Captain Jackson was coming, and had a great many fine horses and blankets and guns and everything else and if they would come out and help to whip him and to take his plunder, it should all be divided with those in the fort. They promised that when Jackson came, they would then come out to help and whip him. It was about an hour, by sun in the morning, when we got near the fort. We were piloted by friendly Indians, and divided as we had done on a former occasion, so as to go to the right and left of the fort, and consequently of the warriors who were camped near it. Our lines marched on, as before, till they met in front, and they closed in the rear, forming again into a hollow square. We then sent on old Major Russell with his spy company to bring on the battle. Captain Evans' company went also. When they got near the fort, the top of it was lined with the friendly Indians, crying out as loud as they could roar, "'Howdy do, brother!' Howdy do! They kept this up till Major Russell had passed by the fort and was moving on towards the warriors. They were all painted as red as scarlet and were just as naked as they were born. They had concealed themselves under the bank of a branch that ran partly around the fort in the manner of a half moon. Russell was going right into their circle, for he couldn't see them, while the Indians on the top of the fort were trying every plan to show him his danger but he couldn't understand them. At last, two of them jumped from it and ran and took his horse by the bridle, and pointing to where they were, told him there were thousands of them lying under the bank. This brought them to a halt, and about this moment the Indians fired on them, and came rushing forth like a cloud of Egyptian locusts, and screaming like all the young devils had been turned loose, with the old devil of all at their head. Russell's company quit their horses, and took into the fort, and their horses ran up to our line which was then in full view. The warriors then came yelling on meeting us, and continued till they were within shot of us, when we fired and killed a considerable number of them. Then they broke like a gang of steers, and ran across to our other line, where they were again fired on, and so we kept them running from one line to the other, constantly under a heavy fire, until we had killed upwards of four hundred of them. They fought with guns, and also with their bows and arrows. 
but at length they made their escape through a part of our line which was made up of drafted militia which broke ranks and they passed we lost fifteen of our men as brave fellows as ever lived or died we buried them all in one grave and started back to our fort but before we got there two more of our men died of wounds they had received making our total loss seventeen good fellows in that battle we now remained at the fort for a few days but no provision came yet and we were all likely to perish the weather also began to get very cold and our clothes were nearly worn out and horses getting very feeble and poor our officers proposed to general jackson to let us return home and get fresh horses and fresh clothing so as to be better prepared for another campaign for our sixty days had long been out and that was the time we entered for but the general took the responsibility on himself and refused we were however determined to go as i am to put back the deposits if i can with this the general issued his orders against it as he has against the bank but we began to fix for a start as provisions were too scarce just as clay and webster and myself are preparing to fix bank matters on account of the scarcity of money the general went and placed his cannon on a bridge we had to cross and ordered out his regulars and drafted men to keep us from crossing just as he had planted his globe and kc to alarm the bank men while his regulars and militia in congress are to act as artillery men but when the militia started to guard the bridge they would holler back to us to bring their knapsacks along when we come for they wanted to go as bad as we did just as many a good fellow now wants his political knapsack brought along that if when we come to vote he sees he has a fair shake to go he may join in and help us take back the deposits we got ready and moved on till we came near the bridge where the general's men were all strung along on both sides just like the office holders are now to keep us from getting along to the help of the country and the people but we all had our flints ready picked and our guns ready primed that if we were fired on we might fight our way through or all die together just as we are now determined to save the country from ready ruin or to sink down with it when we came still nearer the bridge we heard the guards cocking their guns and we did the same just as we have had it in congress while the government regulars and the people's volunteers have all been setting their political triggers but after all we marched boldly on and not a gun was fired nor a life lost just as i hope it will be again that we shall not be afraid of the general's globe nor his k c nor his regulars nor their trigger snapping but just march boldly over the executive bridge and take the deposits back where the law placed them and where they ought to be when we had passed no further attempt was made to stop us but the general said we were the damnedest volunteers he had ever seen in his life that we would volunteer and go out and fight and then at our pleasure would volunteer and go home again in spite of the devil but we went on and near huntsville we met a reinforcement who were going on to join the army it consisted of a regiment of volunteers and was under the command of some one whose name i can't remember they were sixty-day volunteers we got home pretty safely and in a short time we had procured fresh horses and a supply of clothing better suited for the season and then we returned to fort deposit where our officers held a sort of a national convention on the subject of a message they had received from general jackson demanding that on our return we should serve out six months we had already served three months instead of two which was the time we had volunteered for on the next morning the officers reported to us the conclusions they had come to and told us if any of us felt bound to go on and serve out the six months we could do so but that they intended to go back home i knowed if i went back home i couldn't rest for i felt it my duty to be out and when out was somehow or other always delighted to be in the very thicks of the danger a few of us therefore determined to push on and join the army the number i do not recollect but it was very small when we got out there i joined major russell's company of spies before we reached the place general jackson had started 
we went on likewise and overtook him at a place where we established a fort called fort williams and leaving men to guard it we went ahead intending to go to a place called the horseshoe bend of the tallapoosa river when we came near that place we began to find indian sign plenty and we struck up camp for the night about two hours before day we heard our guard firing and we were all up in little or no time we mended our campfires and then fell back in the dark expecting to see the indians pouring in and intending when they should do so to shoot them by the light of our own fires but it happened that they did not rush in as we had expected but commenced a fire on us as we were we were encamped in a hollow square and we not only returned the fire but continued to shoot as well as we could in the dark till day broke when the indians disappeared the only guide we had in shooting was to notice the flash of their guns and then shoot as directly at the place as we could guess in this scrape we had four men killed and several wounded but whether we killed any of the indians or not we never could tell for it is their custom always to carry off their dead if they can possibly do so we buried ours and then made a large log heap over them and set it on fire so that the place of their deposit might not be known to the savages who we knew would seek for them that they might scalp them we made some horse litters for our wounded and took up a retreat we moved on till we came to a large creek which we had to cross and about half of our men had crossed when the indians commenced firing on our left wing and they kept it up very warmly we had left major russell and his brother at the camp we had moved from that morning to see what discovery they could make as to the movements of the indians and about this time while a warm fire was kept up on our left as i have just stated the major came up in our rear and was closely pursued by a large number of indians who immediately commenced a fire on our artillerymen they hid themselves behind a large log and could kill one of our men almost every shot they being in open ground and exposed the worst of all was two of our colonels just at this trying moment left their men and by a forced march crossed the creek out of the reach of the fire their names at this late day would do the world no good and my object is history alone and not the slightest interference with character an opportunity was now afforded for governor carroll to distinguish himself and on this occasion he did so by greater bravery than i ever saw any other man display in truth i believe as firmly as i do that general jackson is president and if it hadn't been for carroll we should all have been genteelly licked that time for we were in a devil of a fix part of our men on one side of the creek and part on the other and the indians all the time pouring it on us as hot as fresh mustard to a sore shin i will not say exactly that the old general was whipped but i will say that if we escaped it at all it was like old henry snyder going to heaven might a tom tight squeeze i think he would confess himself that he was nearer whipped this time than he was at any other for i know that all the world couldn't make him acknowledge that he was pointedly whipped i know i was mighty glad when it was over and the savages quit us for i had begun to think that there was one behind every tree in the woods we buried our dead the number of whom i have also forgotten and again made horse litters to carry our wounded and so we put out and returned to fort williams from which place we had started in the meantime my horse had got crippled and was unfit for service and as another reinforcement had arrived i thought they could get along without me for a short time so i got a furlough and went home for we had had hard times again on this hunt and i began to feel as though i had done indian fighting enough for one time i remained at home until the army had returned to the horseshoe bend and fought the battle there but not being with them at that time of course no history of that fight can be expected of me end of chapter six chapter seven of narrative of the life of david crockett of the state of tennessee this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Nick Polka Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett Chapter 7 Soon after this, an army was to be raised to go to Pensacola, and I determined to go again with them, for I wanted a small taste of British fighting, and I supposed they would be there. Here again the entreaties of my wife were thrown in the way of my going, but all in vain, for I always had a way of just going ahead at whatever I had a mind to. One of my neighbors, hearing I had determined to go, came to me and offered me a hundred dollars to go in his place as a substitute, as he had been drafted. I told him I was better raised than to hire myself out to be shot at, but that I would go, and he should go too, and in that way the government would have the services of us both. But we didn't call General Jackson the government in those days, though we used to go and fight under him in the war. I fixed up and joined old Major Russell again, but we couldn't start with the main army, but followed on in a little time after them. In a day or two we had a hundred and thirty men in our company, and we went over and crossed the Muscle Shoals at the same place where I had crossed when first out, and when we burned the Black Warrior's town. We passed through the Choctaw and Chickasaw nations on to Fort Stevens and from thence to what is called the cut-off at the junction of the Tom Bigby with the Alabama River. This place is near the old Fort Mims, where the Indians committed the great butchery at the commencement of the war. We were here about two days behind the main army, who had left their horses at the cut-off, and taken it on foot, and they did this because there was no chance for forage between there and Pensacola. We did the same, leaving men enough to take care of our horses, and cut out on foot for that place. It was about eighty miles off, but in good heart we shouldered our guns, blankets, and provisions, and trudged merrily on. About twelve o'clock the second day, we reached the encampment of the main army, which was situated on a hill overlooking the city of Pensacola. My commander, Major Russell, was a great favorite with General Jackson, and our arrival was hailed with great applause, though we were a little after the feast, for they had taken the town and fort before we got there. That evening we went down into the town, and could see the British fleet lying in sight of the place. We got some liquor, and took a horn or so, and went back to the camp. We remained there that night, and in the morning we marched back towards the cut-off. We pursued this direction till we reached Old Fort Mims, where we remained two or three days. It was here that Major Russell was promoted from his command, which was only that of a captain of spies, to the command of a major in the line. He had been known long before at home as Old Major Russell, and so we all continued to call him in the army. A Major Childs from East Tennessee also commanded a battalion, and his and the one Russell was now appointed to command composed a regiment, which, by agreement with General Jackson, was to quit his army and go to the south to kill up the Indians on the Scamby River. General Jackson and the main army set out the next morning for New Orleans, and a Colonel Blue took command of the regiment, which I have before described. We remained, however, a few days after the General's departure, and then started also on our route. As it gave rise to so much war and bloodshed, it may not be improper here to give a little description of Fort Mims, and the manner in which the Indian War commenced. The fort was built right in the middle of a large old field, and in it the people had been forted so long and so quietly that they didn't apprehend any danger at all, and had therefore become quite careless. A small negro boy, whose business it was to bring up the calves at milking time, had been out for that purpose, and, on coming back, he said he saw a great many Indians. At this the inhabitants took the alarm, and closed their gates and placed out their guards, which they continued for a few days. But finding that no attack was made, they concluded the little negro had lied, and again threw their gates open and set all their hands out to work their fields. The same boy was out again on the same errand, when, returning in great haste and alarm, he informed them that he had seen the Indians as thick as trees in the woods. He was not believed, but was tucked up to receive a flogging for the supposed lie, 
and was actually getting badly licked at the very moment when the indians came in a troop loaded with rails with which they'd stopped all the portholes of the fort on one side except the bastion and then they fell into cutting down the picketing those inside the fort had only the bastion to shoot from as all the other holes were spiked up and they shot several of the indians while engaging in cutting but as fast as one would fall another would seize up the axe and chop away until they succeeded in cutting down enough of the picketing to admit them to enter they then began to rush through and continued until they were all in they immediately commenced scalping without regard to age or sex having forced the inhabitants up to one side of the fort where they carried on the work of death as a butcher would in a slaughter pen the scene was particularly described to me by a young man who was in the fort when it happened and subsequently went on with us to pensacola he said that he saw his father and mother his four sisters and the same number of brothers all butchered in the most shocking manner and that he made his escape by running over the heads of the crowd who were against the fort wall to the top of the fort and then jumping off and taking to the woods he was closely pursued by several Indians, until he came to a small bio across which there was a log. He knew the log was hollow on the underside, so he slipped under the log and hid himself. He said he heard the Indians walk over him several times back and forward. He remained, nevertheless, still till night, when he came out and finished his escape. The name of this young man has entirely escaped my recollection, though his tale greatly excited my feelings. But, to return to my subject, the regiment marched from where General Jackson had left us to Fort Montgomery, which was distant from Fort Mims, about a mile and a half, and there we remained for some days. Here we supplied ourselves pretty well with beef by killing wild cattle which had formerly belonged to the people who perished in the fort, but had gone wild after their massacre. When we marched from Fort Montgomery, we went some distance back towards Pensacola, then we turned to the left and passed through a poor piney country till we reached the scamby river near where we encamped we had about one thousand men and as a part of that number one hundred and eighty six chickasaw and choctaw indians with us that evening a boat landed from pensacola bringing many articles that were both good and necessary such as sugar and coffee and liquors of all kinds the same evening the indians we had along proposed to cross the river and the officers thinking it might be well for them to do so consented and major russell went with them taking sixteen white men of which number i was one we camped on the opposite bank that night and early in the morning we set out we had not gone far before we came to a place where the whole country was covered with water and looked like a sea we didn't stop for this, though, but just put in like so many spaniels and waded on, sometimes up to our armpits, until we reached the pine hills, which made our distance through the water about a mile and a half. Here we struck up a fire to warm ourselves, for it was cold, and we were chilled through by being so long in the water. We again moved on, keeping our spies out, two to our left near the bank of the river, two straight before us, and two others on our right. We had gone in this way about six miles up the river, when our spies on the left came to us leaping the brush like so many old bucks, and informed us that they had discovered a camp of Creek Indians, and that we must kill them. Here we paused for a few minutes, and the prophets pow-wowed over their men a while, and then got out their paint and painted them, all according to their custom when going into battle. Then they brought their paint to old Major Russell and said to him that as he was an officer he must be painted too he agreed and they painted him just as they had done themselves we let the indians understand that we white men would first fire on the camp and then fall back so as to give the indians a chance to rush in and scalp them the chickasaws marched on our left hand and the choctaws on our right and we moved on till we got in hearing of the camp where the indians were employed in beating up what they called cheney briar root on this they mostly subsisted on a nearer approach we found they were on an island and that we could not get to them 
while we were chatting about this matter we heard some guns fired and in a very short time after a keen whoop which satisfied us that wherever it was there was a war on a small scale with that we all broke like quarter horses for the firing and when we got there we found it was our two front spies who related to us the following story as they were moving on they had met with two creeks who were out hunting near their horses as they approached each other there was a large cluster of green bay bushes exactly between them so that they were within a few feet of meeting before either was discovered our spies walked up to them and speaking in the shawnee tongue informed them that general jackson was at pensacola and they were making their escape and wanted to know where they could get something to eat the creeks told them that nine miles up the conacher the river they were then on there was a large camp of creeks and they had cattle and plenty to eat and further that their own camp was on an island about a mile off and just below the mouth of the conacher they held their conversation and struck up a fire and smoked together and shook hands and parted one of the creeks had a gun the other had none and as soon as they had parted our choctaws turned round and shot down the one that had the gun and the other attempted to run off they snapped several times at him but the gun still missing fire they took after him and overtaking him one of them struck him over the head with his gun and followed up his blows till he killed him the gun was broken in the combat and they then fired off the gun of the creek they had killed and raised the war whoop when we reached them they had cut off the heads of both the indians and each of those indians with us would walk up to one of the heads and taking his war club would strike on it this was done by every one of them and when they had got done i took one of their clubs and walked up as they had done and struck it on the head also at this they all gathered round me and patting me on the shoulder called me warrior warrior they scalped the heads and then we moved on a short distance to where we found a trace leading in towards the river we took the trace and pursued it till we came to where a spaniard had been killed and scalped together with a woman who we supposed to be his wife and also four children i began to feel mighty ticklish along about this time for i knowed if there was no danger then there had been and i felt exactly like there still was we however went on till we struck the river and then continued down it till we came opposite to the indian camp where we found they were still beating their roots it was now late in the evening and they were in a thick cane break we had some few friendly creeks with us who said they could decoy them so we all hid behind trees and logs while the attempt was made the indians would not agree that we should fire but picked out some of their best gunners and placed them near the river our creeks went down to the riverside and hailed the camp in the creek language we heard an answer and an indian man started down toward the river but didn't come in sight he went back again commenced beating his roots and sent a squaw she came down and talked with our creeks until dark came on they told her they wanted her to bring them a canoe to which she replied that their canoe was on our side that two of their men had gone out to hunt their horses and hadn't yet returned they were the same two we had killed the canoe was found and forty of our picked indian warriors were crossed over to take the camp there was at last only one man in it and he escaped and they took two squaws and ten children but killed none of them of course we had run nearly out of provisions and major russell had determined to go up the conacher to the camp we had heard of from the indians we had killed i was one that he selected to go down the river that night for provisions with the canoe to where we had left our regiment i took with me a man by the name of john guess and one of the friendly creeks and cut out it was very dark and the river was so full that it overflowed the banks and the adjacent low bottoms this rendered it very difficult to keep the channel and particularly as the river was very crooked at about ten o'clock at night we reached the camp and were to return by morning to major russell with provisions for his trip up the river but on informing colonel blue of this arrangement he vetoed it as quick as general jackson did the bank bill and said if major russell didn't come back the next day it would be bad times for him i found we were not to go up to conacher to the indian camp and a man of my company offered to go up in my place to inform major russell 
I let him go, and they reached the major, as I was told, about sunrise in the morning, who immediately returned with those who were with him to the regiment, and joined us where we crossed the river, as hereafter stated. The next morning we all fixed up and marched down the Scamby to a place called Miller's Landing, where we swam our horses across and sent on two companies down on the side of the bay opposite to Pensacola, where the Indians had fled when the main army first marched to that place. One was the company of Captain William Russell, a son of the old major, and the other was commanded by a Captain Trimble. They went on and had a little skirmish with the Indians. They killed some, and took all the balance prisoners, though I don't remember the numbers. We again met those companies in a day or two, and sent the prisoners they had taken on to Fort Montgomery in charge of some of our Indians. I did hear that after they left us the Indians killed and scalped all the prisoners, and I never heard the report contradicted. I cannot positively say it was true, but I think it entirely probable, for it is very much like the Indian character. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lynn Thompson Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the state of tennessee by david crockett chapter eight when we made a move from the point where we met the companies we set out for chattahatchee the place for which we had started when we left fort montgomery at the start we had taken only twenty days rations of flour and eight days rations of beef and it was now thirty-four days before we reached that place we were therefore in extreme suffering for want of something to eat and exhausted with our exposure and the fatigues of our journey i remember well that i had not myself tasted bread but twice in nineteen days i had bought a pretty good supply of coffee from the boat that had reached us from pensacola on the scamby and on that we chiefly subsisted at length one night our spies came in and informed us they had found holmes's village on the chattahatchee river and we made an immediate push for that place we travelled all night expecting to get something to eat when we got there we arrived about sunrise and near the place prepared for battle we were all so furious that even the certainty of a pretty hard fight could not have restrained us we made a furious charge on the town, but, to our great mortification and surprise, there wasn't a human being in it. The Indians had all run off and left it. We burned the town, however, but, melancholy to tell, we found no provision whatever. We then turned about and went back to the camp we had left the night before, as nearly starved as any set of poor fellows ever were in the world. We stayed there only a little while, when we divided our regiment, and Major Childs, with his men, went back the way we had come for a considerable distance, and then turned to Baton Rouge, where they joined General Jackson and the main army on their return from Orleans. Major Russell and his men struck for Fort Decatur, on the Tallapoosa River. Some of our friendly Indians who knew the country went on ahead of us, as we had no trail except the one they made to follow with them we sent some of our ablest horses and men to get us some provisions to prevent us from absolutely starving to death as the army marched i hunted every day and would kill every hawk bird and squirrel that i could find others did the same and it was a rule with us that when we stopped at night the hunters would throw all they killed in a pile and then we would make a general division among all the men one evening i came in having killed nothing that day i had a very sick man in my mess and i wanted something for him to eat even if i starved myself so i went to the fire of a captain cowan who commanded my company after the promotion of major russell and informed him that i was on the hunt of something for a sick man to eat I knowed the captain was as bad off as the rest of us, but I found him broiling a turkey's gizzard. 
He said he had divided the turkey out among the sick, that Major Smiley had killed it, and that nothing else had been killed that day. I immediately went to Smiley's fire, where I found him broiling another gizzard. I told him that it was the first turkey I had ever seen have two gizzards. But so it was, I got nothing for my sick man, and now seeing that every fellow must shift for himself, I determined that in the morning I would come up missing. So I took my mess and cut out to go ahead of the army. We knowed that nothing more could happen to us if we went than if we stayed, for it looked like it was to be starvation anyway. We therefore determined to go on the old saying, root hog or die. We passed two camps at which our men, that had gone on before us, had killed Indians. At one they had killed nine, and at the other three. About daylight we came to a small river, which I thought was the Scamby, but we continued on for three days, killing little or nothing to eat, till, at last, we all began to get nearly ready to give up the ghost, and lie down and die, for we had no prospect of provision, and we knew we couldn't go much further without it. We came to a large prairie that was about six miles across it, and in this I saw a trail which I knowed was made by bear, deer, and turkeys. We went on through it till we came to a large creek, and the low grounds were all set over with wild rye, looking as green as a wheat field. We here made a halt, unsaddled our horses, and turned them loose to graze. One of my companions, a Mr. Van Zant, and myself, then went up the low grounds to hunt. We had gone some distance, finding nothing, when at last I found a squirrel, which I shot, but he got into a hole in the tree. The game was small, but necessity is not very particular, so I thought I must have him, and I climbed that tree thirty feet high, without a limb, and pulled him out of his hole. I shouldn't relate such small matters only to show what lengths a hungry man will go to to get something to eat. I soon killed two other squirrels and fired at a large hawk. At this a large gang of turkeys rose from the cane brake and flew across the creek to where my friend was, who had just before crossed it. He soon fired on a large gobbler, and I heard it fall. By this time my gun was loaded again, and I saw one sitting on my side of the creek, which had flew over when he fired. So I blazed away, and down I brought him. I gathered him up, and a fine turkey he was. I now began to think we had struck a breeze of luck, and almost forgot our past sufferings, in the prospect of once more having something to eat. I raised the shout, and my comrade came to me, and we went on to our camp with the game we had killed. While we were gone, two of our mess had been out, and each of them had found a bee-tree. We turned into cooking some of our game, but we had neither salt nor bread. Just at this moment, on looking down the creek, we saw our men, who had gone on before us for provisions, coming to us. They came up and measured out to each man a cupful of flour. With this we thickened our soup, when our turkey was cooked, and our friends took dinner with us, and then went on. We now took our tomahawks, and went and cut our bee-trees, out of which we got a fine chance of honey. Though we had been starving so long that we feared to eat much at a time, till, like the Irish by hanging, we got used to it again. We rested that night without moving our camp and the next morning myself and Van Zant again turned out to hunt. We had not gone far before I wounded a fine buck very badly, and while pursuing him I was walking on a large tree that had fallen down, when, from the top of it, a large bear broke out and ran off. I had no dogs, and I was sorry enough for it, for of all the hunting I ever did I have always delighted most in bear hunting. Soon after this I killed a large buck, and we had just gotten him to camp when our poor starved army came up. They told us that to lessen their sufferings as much as possible, Captain William Russell had had his horse led up to be shot for them to eat, just at the moment that they saw our men returning, who had carried on the flour. We were now about fourteen miles from Fort Decatur, and we gave away all our meat and honey, and went on with the rest of the army. When we got there, they could give us only one ration of meat, but not a mouthful of bread. 
I immediately got a canoe and taking my gun crossed over the river and went to the big warriors town I had a large hat and I offered an Indian a silver dollar for my hat full of corn He told me that his corn was all Shuestia which in English means it was all gone But he showed me where an Indian lived who he said had corn I Went to him and made the same offer he could talk a little broken English and said to me you got any powder you got bullet I Told him I had then he said me swap my corn for powder and bullet I Took out about ten bullets and showed him and he proposed to give me a hat full of corn for them I took him up mighty quick I then offered to give him ten charges of powder for another hat full of corn to this he agreed very willingly so I took off my hunting shirt and tied up my corn and though it had cost me very little of my powder and lead yet I wouldn't have taken fifty silver dollars for it I Returned to the camp and the next morning we started for the hickory ground which was 30 miles off It was here that General Jackson met the Indians and made peace with the body of the nation We got nothing to eat at this place and we had yet to go 49 miles over a rough and wilderness country to Fort Williams Parched corn and but little even of that was our daily subsistence When we reached Fort Williams we got one ration of pork and one of flour Which was our only hope until we could reach Fort Strother The horses were now giving out and I remember to have seen 13 good horses left in one day the saddles and bridles being thrown away It was 39 miles to Fort Strother and we had to pass directly by Fort Talladego where we first had the big Indian battle with the 1100 painted warriors We went through the old battleground and it looked like a great gourd patch The skulls of the Indians who were killed still lay scattered all about and many of their frames were still perfect as the bones had not separated But about five miles before we got to this battleground I struck a trail which I followed until it led me to one of their towns Here I swapped some more of my powder and bullets for a little corn I pursued on by myself till some time in the night when I came up with the rest of the army That night my company and myself did pretty well as I divided out my corn among them The next morning we met the East Tennessee troops who were on the road to Mobile and my youngest brother was with them They had plenty of corn and provisions and they gave me what I wanted for myself and my horse I remained with them that night though my company went across the Coosa River to the fort where they also had the good fortune to find plenty of provisions Next morning I took leave of my brother and all my old neighbors For there were a good many of them with him and crossed over to my men at the fort Here I had enough to go on and after remaining a few days cut out for home Nothing more worthy of the readers attention transpired till I was safely landed at home once more with my wife and children I found them all well and doing well and though I was only a rough sort of a backwoodsman They seemed mighty glad to see me however little the quality folks might suppose it For I do reckon we love as hard in the backwood country as any people in the whole creation but I had been home only a few days when we received orders to start again and go on to the Black Warrior and Cahorba rivers to see if there was no Indians there I knowed well enough there was none and I wasn't willing to trust my craw any more where there was neither any fighting to do nor anything to go on and so I agreed to give a young man who wanted to go the balance of my wages if he would serve out my time which was about a month he did so and when they returned sure enough they hadn't seen an Indian any more than if they had been all the time chopping wood in my clearing This closed my career as a warrior and I am glad of it for I like life now a heap better than I did then and I am glad all over that I lived to see these times which I should not have done if I had kept falling along in war and got used up at it when I say I am glad I just mean I am glad I am alive for there is a confounded heap of things I ain't glad of at all I ain't glad for example that the government moved the deposits and if my military glory should take such a turn as to make me president after the general's time I'll move them back yes I the government will take the responsibility and move them back again if I don't I wish I may be shot 
but i am glad that i am now through war matters and i reckon the reader is too for they have no fun in them at all and less if he had to pass through them first and then to write them afterwards but for the dullness of their narrative i must try to make amends by relating some of the curious things that happened to me in private life and when forced to become a public man as i shall have to be again if ever i consent to take the presidential chair End of chapter 8chapter nine of narrative of the life of david crockett of the state of tennessee this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by dion johns salt lake city utah narrative of the life of david crockett of the state of tennessee by david crockett chapter nine i continued at home now working my farm for two years as the war finally closed soon after i quit the service the battle at new orleans had already been fought and treaties were made with the indians which put a stop to their hostilities but in this time i met with the hardest trial which ever falls to the lot of man death that cruel leveller of all distinctions to whom the prayers and tears of husbands and of even helpless infancy are addressed in vain entered my humble cottage and tore from my children an affectionate good mother and from me a tender and loving wife it is a scene long gone by and one which it would be supposed i had almost forgotten yet when i turn my memory back on it it seems as but the work of yesterday it was the doing of the almighty whose ways are always right though we sometimes think they fall heavily on us and as painful as is even yet the remembrance of her sufferings and the loss sustained by my little children and myself yet i have no wish to lift up the voice of complaint i was left with three children the two oldest were sons the youngest a daughter and at that time a mere infant it appeared to me at that moment that my situation was the worst in the world i couldn't bear the thought of scattering my children and so i got my youngest brother who was also married and his family to live with me they took as good care of my children as they well could but yet it wasn't all like the care of a mother and though their company was to me in every respect like that of a brother and sister yet it fell far short of being like that of a wife so i came to the conclusion it wouldn't do but that i must have another wife there lived in the neighborhood a widow lady whose husband had been killed in the war she had two children a son and a daughter and both quite small like my own i began to think that as we were both in the same situation it might be that we could do something for each other and i therefore began to hint a little around the matter as we were once in a while together she was a good industrious woman and owned a snug little farm and lived quite comfortable i soon began to pay my respects to her in real good earnest but i was as sly about it as a fox when he is going to rob a hen roost i found that my company wasn't at all disagreeable to her and i thought i could treat her children with so much friendship as to make her a good stepmother to mine and in this i wasn't mistaken as we soon bargained and got married and then went ahead in a great deal of peace we raised our first crop of children and they are all married and doing well but we had a second crop together and i shall notice them as i go along as my wife and myself both had a hand in them and they therefore belong to the history of my second marriage the next fall after this marriage three of my neighbors and myself determined to explore a new country their names were robinson fraser and rich we set out for the creek country crossing the tennessee river and after having made a day's travel we stopped at the house of one of my old acquaintances who had settled there after the war resting here a day fraser turned out to hunt being a great hunter but he got badly bit by a very poisonous snake and so we left him and went on we passed through a large rich valley called jones's valley where several other families had settled and continued our course till we came near to the place where tuscaloosa now stands 
here we camped and as there were no inhabitants and hobbled out our horses for the night about two hours before day we heard the bells on our horses going back the way we had come as they had started to leave us as soon as it was daylight i started in pursuit of them on foot and carrying my rifle which was a very heavy one i went ahead the whole day wading creeks and swamps and climbing mountains but i couldn't overtake our horses though i could hear of them at every house they passed i at last found i couldn't catch up with them and so i gave up the hunt and turned back to the last house i had passed and stayed there till morning from the best calculation we could make i had walked over fifty miles that day and the next morning i was so sore and fatigued that i felt like i couldn't walk any more but i was anxious to get back to where i had left my company and so i started and went on but mighty slowly till after the middle of the day i now began to feel mighty sick and had a dreadful headache my rifle was so heavy and i felt so weak that i lay down by the side of the trace in a perfect wilderness too to see if i wouldn't get better in a short time some indians came along they had some ripe melons and wanted me to eat some but i was so sick i couldn't then they signed to me that i would die and be buried a thing i was confoundedly afraid of myself but i asked them how near it was to any house by their signs again they made me understand it was a mile and a half i got up to go but when i rose i reeled about like a cow with the blind staggers or a fellow who had taken too many horns one of the indians proposed to go with me and carry my gun i gave him half a dollar and accepted his offer we got to the house by which time i was pretty far gone but was kindly received and got on to a bed the woman did all she could for me with her warm teas but i still continued bad enough with a high fever and generally out of my senses the next day two of my neighbors were passing the road and heard of my situation and came to where i was they were going nearly the route i had intended to go to look at the country and so they took me first on one of their horses and then on the other till they got me back to where i had left my company i expected i would get better and be able to go on with them but instead of this i got worse and worse and when we got there i wasn't able to sit up at all i thought now the jig was mighty nigh up with me but i determined to keep a stiff upper lip they carried me to a house and each of my comrades bought him a horse and they all set out together leaving me behind i knew but little that was going on for about two weeks but the family treated me with every possible kindness in their power and i shall always feel thankful to them the man's name was jesse jones at the end of two weeks i began to mend without the help of a doctor or of any doctor's means in this time however as they told me i was speechless for five days and they had no thought that i would ever speak again in congress or anywhere else and so the woman who had a bottle of batesman's draps thought if they killed me i would only die anyhow and so she would try it with me she gave me the whole bottle which throwed me into a sweat that continued on me all night when at last i seemed to make up and spoke and asked her for a drink of water this almost alarmed her for she was looking every minute for me to die she gave me the water and from that time i began slowly to mend and so kept on till i was able at last to walk about a little i might easily have been mistaken for one of the kitchen cabinet i looked so much like a ghost i have been particular in giving a history of this sickness not because i believe it will interest anybody much now nor indeed do i certainly know that it ever will but if i should be forced to take the white house then it will be good history and every one will look on it as important and i can't for my life help laughing now to think that when all my folks get around me wanting good fat offices how so many of them will say what a good thing it was that that kind woman had the bottle of draps that saved president crockett's life the second greatest and best good says i my noble fellow you take the post office or the navy or the war office or maybe the treasury but if i give him the treasury there's no devil if i don't make him agree first to fetch back them deposits and if it's even the post office i'll make him promise to keep his money counts without any figuring as that throws the whole concern heels over head in debt 
in little or no time but when i got so i could travel a little i got a wagoner who was passing along to haul me to where he lived which was about twenty-five miles from my house i still mended as we went along and when we got to his stopping place i hired one of his horses and went on home i was so pale and so much reduced that my face looked like it had been half sold with brown paper when i got there it was to the utter astonishment of my wife for she supposed i was dead my neighbors who had started with me had returned and took my horse home which they had found with theirs and they reported that they had seen men who had helped to bury me and who saw me draw my last breath i know this was a whopper of a lie as soon as i heard it my wife had hired a man and sent him out to see what had become of my money and other things but i had missed the man as i went in and he didn't return until some time after i got home as he went all the way to where i lay sick before he heard that i was still in the land of the living and a kicking the place on which i lived was sickly and i was determined to leave it i therefore set out the next fall to look at the country which had been purchased of the chickasaw tribe of indians i went on to a place called shoal creek about eighty miles from where i lived and here again i got sick i took the ague and fever which i supposed was brought on me by camping out i remained here for some time as i was unable to go farther and in that time i became so well pleased with the country about there that i resolved to settle in it it was just only a little distance in the purchase and no order had been established there but i thought i could get along without order as well as anybody else and so i moved and settled myself down on the head of shoal creek we remained there some two or three years without any law at all and so many bad characters began to flock in upon us that we found it necessary to set up a sort of temporary government of our own i don't mean that we made any president and called him the government but we met and made what we called a corporation and i reckon we called it wrong for it wasn't a bank and hadn't any deposits and now they call the bank a corporation but be this as it may we lived in the backwoods and didn't profess to know much and no doubt used many wrong words but we met and appointed magistrates and constables to keep order we didn't fix any laws for them though for we supposed they would know law enough whoever they might be and so we left it to themselves to fix the laws i was appointed one of the magistrates and when a man owed a debt and wouldn't pay it i and my constable ordered our warrant and then we would take the man and bring him before me for trial i would give judgment against him and then an order of execution would easily scare the dead out of him if any one was charged with marking his neighbor's hogs or with stealing anything which happened pretty often in those days i would have him taken and if there was tolerable grounds for the charge i would have him well whipped and cleared we kept this up till our legislature added us to the white settlements in giles county and appointed magistrates by law to organize matters in the parts where i lived they appointed nearly every man a magistrate who had belonged to our corporation i was then of course made a squire according to law though now the honor rested more heavily on me than before for at first whenever i told my constable says i catch that fellow and bring him up for trial away he went and the fellow must come dead or alive for we considered this a good warrant though it was only in verbal writings but after i was appointed by the assembly they told me my warrants must be in real writing and signed and that i must keep a book and write my proceedings in it this was a hard business on me for i could just barely write my own name but to do this and write the warrants too was at least a huckleberry over my persimmon i had a pretty well informed constable however and he aided me very much in this business indeed i had so much confidence in him that i told him when we should happen to be out anywhere and see that a warrant was necessary and we would have a good effect he needn't take the trouble to come all the way to me to get one but he could just fill one out and then on the trial i could correct the whole business if he had committed any error in this way i got on pretty well till by care and attention i improved my handwriting in such manner as to be able to prepare my warrants and keep my record-book without much difficulty 
my judgments were never appealed from and if they had been they would have stuck like wax as i gave my decisions on the principles of common justice and honesty between man and man and relied on natural-born sense and not on law learning to guide me for i had never read a page in a law book in all my life end of chapter nine Chapter 10 of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. Chapter 10 about the time we were getting under good headway in our new government a captain matthews came to me and told me he was a candidate for the office of colonel of a regiment and that i must run for first major in the same regiment i objected to this telling him that i thought i had done my share of fighting and that i wanted nothing to do with military appointments he still insisted until at last i agreed and of course had every reason to calculate on his support in my election he was an early settler in that country and made rather more corn than the rest of us and knowing it would afford him a good opportunity to electioneer a little he made a great corn husking and a great frolic and gave a general treat asking everybody over the whole country myself and my family were of course invited when i got there i found a very large collection of people and some friend of mine soon informed me that the captain's son was going to offer against me for the office of major which he had seemed so anxious for me to get i cared nothing about the office but it put my dander up high enough to see that after he had pressed me so hard to offer he was countenancing if not encouraging a secret plan to beat me i took the old gentleman out and asked him about it he told me it was true his son was going to run as a candidate and that he hated worse to run against me than any man in the county i told him his son need give himself no uneasiness about that that i shouldn't run against him for major but against his daddy for a colonel he took me by the hand and we went into the company he then made a speech and informed the people that i was his opponent i mounted up for a speech too i told the people the cause of my opposing him remarking that as i had the whole family to run against anyway i was determined to levy on the head of the mess when the time for the election came his son was opposed by another man for major and he and his daddy were both badly beaten i just now began to take a rise as in a little time i was asked to offer for the legislature in the counties of lawrence and heckman i offered my name in the month of february and started about the first of march with a drove of horses to the lower part of the state of north carolina this was in the year eighteen twenty one and i was gone upwards of three months i returned and set out electioneering which was a bran fire new business to me it now became necessary that i should tell the people something about the government and an eternal sight of other things that i knowed nothing more about than i did about latin and law and such things as that i have said before that in those days none of us called general jackson the government nor did he seem in as fair a way to become so as i do now but i knowed so little about it that if any one had told me he was the government i should have believed it for i had never read even a newspaper in my life or anything else on the subject but over all my difficulties it seems to me i was born for luck though it would be hard for any one to guess what sort i will however explain that hereafter i first went into heckman county to see what i could do among the people as a candidate here they told me that they wanted to move their town nearer to the centre of the county and i must come out in favour of it there's no devil if i knowed what this meant or how the town was to be moved and so i kept dark going on the identical same plan that i now find is called non-committal about this time there was a great squirrel hunt on duck river which was among my people they were to hunt two days 
than to meet and count the scalps and have a big barbecue and what might be called a tip-top country frolic the dinner and a general treat was all to be paid for by the party having taken the fewest scalps i joined one side taking the place of one of the hunters and got a gun ready for the hunt i killed a great many squirrels and when we counted scalps my party was victorious the company had everything to eat and drink that could be furnished in so new a country and much fun and good humor prevailed but before the regular frolic commenced i mean the dancing i was called on to make a speech as a candidate which was a business i was as ignorant of as an outlandish negro a public document i had never seen nor did i know there were such things and how to begin i couldn't tell i made many apologies and tried to get off for i knowed i had a man to run against who could speak prime and i knowed too that i wasn't able to shuffle and cut with him he was there and knowing my ignorance as well as i did myself he also urged me to make a speech the truth is he thought my being a candidate was a mere matter of sport and didn't think for a moment that he was in any danger from an ignorant backwoods bear hunter but i found i couldn't get off and so i determined just to go ahead and leave it to chance what i should say i got up and told the people i reckon they knowed what i come for but if not i could tell them i had come for their votes and if they didn't watch mighty close i'd get them too but the worst of all was that i couldn't tell them anything about government i tried to speak about something and i cared very little what until i choked up as bad as if my mouth had been jammed and crammed chock full of dry mush there the people stood listening all the while with their eyes mouths and ear all open to catch every word i would speak at last i told them i was like a fellow i had heard of not long before he was beating on the head of an empty barrel near the roadside when a traveller who was passing along asked him what he was doing that for the fellow replied that there was some cider in that barrel a few days before and he was trying to see if there was any then but if there was he couldn't get at it i told them that there had been a little bit of a speech in me a while ago but i believed i couldn't get it out they all roared out in a mighty laugh and i told them some other anecdotes equally amusing to them and believing i had them in a first-rate way i quit and got down thanking the people for their attention but i took care to remark that i was as dry as a powder horn and that i thought it was time for us all to wet our whistles a little and so i put off to the liquor stand and was followed by the greater part of the crowd i felt certain this was necessary for i knowed my competitor could open government matters to them as easy as he pleased he had however mighty few left to hear him as i continued with the crowd now and then taking a horn and telling good-humoured stories till he was done speaking i found i was good for the votes at the hunt and when we broke up i went on to the town of vernon which was the same they wanted me to move here they pressed me again on the subject and i found i could get either party by agreeing with them but i told them i didn't know whether it would be right or not and so couldn't promise either way their court commenced on the next monday as the barbecue was on a saturday and the candidates for governor and for congress as well as my competitor and myself all attended the thought of having to make a speech made my knees feel mighty weak and set my heart to fluttering almost as bad as my first love scrape with the quaker's niece but as good luck would have it these big candidates spoke nearly all day and when they quit the people were worn out with fatigue which afforded me a good apology for not discussing the government but i listened mighty close to them and was learning pretty fast about political matters when they were all done i got up and told some laughable story and quit i found i was safe in those parts and so i went home and didn't go back again till after the election was over but to cut this matter short i was elected doubling my competitor and nine votes over a short time after this i was in pulaski where i met with colonel polk now a member of congress from tennessee he was at that time a member elected to the legislature as well as myself and in a large company he said to me well colonel i suppose we shall have a radical change 
of the judiciary at the next session of the legislature very likely sir says i and i put out quicker for i was afraid someone would ask me what the judiciary was and if i knowed i wish i may be shot i don't indeed believe i had ever before heard that there was any such thing in all nature but still i was not willing that the people there should know how ignorant i was about it when the time for meeting of the legislature arrived i went on and before i had been there long i could have told what the judiciary was and what the government was too and many other things that i had known nothing about before about this time i met with a very severe misfortune which i may be pardoned for naming as it made a great change in my circumstances and kept me back very much in the world i had built an extensive grist mill and powder mill all connected together and also a large distillery they had cost me upwards of three thousand dollars more than i was worth in the world the first news that i heard after i got to the legislature was that my mills were not blown up sky-high as you would guess by my powder establishment but swept away all to smash by a large fresh that came soon after i left home i had of course to stop my distillery as my grinding was broken up and indeed i may say that the misfortune just made a complete mash of me i had some likely negroes and a good stock of almost everything about me and best of all i had an honest wife she didn't advise me as is too fashionable to smuggle up this and that and t'other, other to go on at home but she told me says she just pay up as long as you have a bit's worth in the world and then everybody will be satisfied and we will scuffle for more this was just such talk as i wanted to hear for a man's wife can hold him devilish uneasy if she begins to scold and fret and perplex him at a time when he has a full load for a railroad car on his mind already and so you see i determined not to break full-handed but thought it better to keep a good conscience with an empty purse than to get a bad opinion of myself with a full one i therefore gave up all i had and took a brand fire new start end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Polka. Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. Chapter 11. Having returned from the legislature, I determined to make another move, and so I took my eldest son with me, and a young man by the name of Abram Henry, and cut out for the Obion. I selected a spot when I got there where I determined to settle, and the nearest house to it was seven miles, the next nearest was fifteen, and so on to twenty. It was a complete wilderness, and full of Indians who were hunting. Game was plenty of almost every kind, which suited me exactly, as I was always fond of hunting. The house which was nearest me, and which, as I have already stated, was seven miles off, and on the different side of the Obion River, belonged to a man by the name of Owens, and I started to go there. I had taken one horse along to pack our provision, and when I got to the water I hobbled him out to graze until I got back as there was no boat to cross the river in, and it was so high that it had overflowed all the bottoms and low country near it. We now took to the water like so many beavers, notwithstanding it was mighty cold, and waded on. The water would sometimes be up to our necks, and at others not so deep, but I went, of course, before and carried a pole with which I would feel along before me to see how deep it was and to guard against falling into a slough, as there was many in our way. When I would come to one, I would take out my tomahawk and cut a small tree across it and then go ahead again. Frequently my little son would have to swim, even where myself and the young man could wade. But we worked on till at last we got to the channel of the river, which made it about half a mile we had waded from where we took water. 
I saw a large tree that had fallen into the river from the other side, but it didn't reach across. One stood on the same bank where we were, that I thought I could fall so as to reach the other, and so at it we went with my tomahawk, cutting away till we got it down, and as good luck would have it, it fell right and made us a way that we could pass. When we got over this, it was still a sea of water as far as our eyes could reach. We took into it again and went ahead for about a mile, hardly ever seeing a single spot of land, and sometimes very deep. At last we come in sight of land, which was a very pleasing thing, and when we got out, we went but a little way before we came in sight of the house, which was more pleasing than ever, for we were wet all over and mighty cold. I felt mighty sorry when I would look at my little boy and see him shaking like he had the worst sort of an ague, for there was no time for fever then. As we got near to the house, we saw Mr. Owens and several men that were with him just starting away. They saw us and stopped, but looked much astonished until we got up to them and I made myself known. The men who were with him were the owners of a boat which was the first that ever went that far up the Obion River, and some hands he had hired to carry it about a hundred miles still further up by water, though it was only about thirty by land, as the river was very crooked. They all turned back to the house with me, where I found Mrs. Owens, a fine, friendly old woman, and her kindness to my little boy did me ten times as much good as anything she could have done for me if she had tried her best. The old gentleman set out his bottle to us, and I concluded that if a horn wasn't good then, there was no use for its invention. So I swigged off about a half pint, and the young man was by no means bashful in such a case. He took a strong pull at it, too. I then gave my boy some, and in a little time we felt pretty well. We dried ourselves by the fire, and were asked to go on board of the boat that evening. I agreed to do so, but left my son with the old lady, and myself and my young man went to the boat with Mr. Owens and the others. The boat was loaded with whiskey, flour, sugar, coffee, salt, castings, and other articles suitable for the country, and they were to receive five hundred dollars to land the boat at Macklemore's Bluff beside the profit they could make on their load. This was merely to show that boats could get up to that point. We stayed all night with them, and had a high night of it, as I took steam enough to drive out all the coal that was in me, and about three times as much more. In the morning we concluded to go on with the boat to where a great hurricane had crossed the river and blowed all the timber down into it. When we got there we found the river was falling fast, and concluded we couldn't get through the timber without more rise. So we dropped down opposite Mr. Owens again, where they determined to wait for more water. The next day it rained rip roariously, and the river rose pretty considerable, but not enough yet. And so I got the boatsmen all to go out with me to where I was going to settle, and we slapped up a cabin in little or no time. I got from the boat four barrels of meal, and one of salt, and about ten gallons of whiskey. To pay for these, I agreed to go with the boat up the river to their landing place. I also got a large middling of bacon, and killed a fine deer, and left them for my young man and my little boy, who were to stay at my cabin till I got back, which I expected would be in six or seven days. We cut out and moved up to the hurricane, where we'd stopped for the night. In the morning I started about daylight, intending to kill the deer, as I had no thought they would get the boat through the timber that day. I had gone but a little way before I killed a fine buck and started to go back to the boat, but on the way I came on the track of a large gang of elks, and so I took after them. I had followed them only a little distance when I saw them, and directly after I saw two large bucks. I shot one down, and the other one wouldn't leave, so I loaded my gun and I shot him down too. I hung them up and went ahead again after my elks. I pursued on till after the middle of the day before I saw them again, but they took the hint before I got in shooting distance and run off. I still pushed on till late in the evening, when I found I was about four miles from where I had left the boat, and as hungry as a wolf, for I hadn't eaten a bite that day. 
I started down the edge of the river low grounds, giving out the pursuit of my elks, and hadn't gone hardly any distance at all before I saw two more bucks, very large fellows, too. I took a blizzard at one of them, and up he tumbled. The other ran off a few jumps and stopped, and stood there till I loaded again and fired at him. I knocked his trotters from under him, and then I hung them both up. I pushed on again, and about sunset I saw three other bucks. I downed with one of them, and the other two ran off. I hung this one up also, having now killed six that day. I then pushed on till I got to the hurricane, and at the lower edge of it, about where I expected the boat was. Here I hollered as hard as I could roar, but could get no answer. I fired off my gun, and the men on the boat fired one too but quite contrary to my expectation, they had got through the timber and were about two miles above me. It was now dark, and I had to crawl through the fallen timber the best way I could, and if the reader don't know it was bad enough, I am sure I do, for the vines and briars had grown all through it, and so thick that a good fat coon couldn't much more than get along. I got through at last, and went on near to where I had killed my last deer, and once more fired off my gun, which was again answered from the boat, which was still a little above me. I moved on as fast as I could, but soon came to water, and, not knowing how deep it was, I halted, and hollered till they came to me with a skiff. I now got to the boat without further difficulty, but the briars had worked on me at such a rate that I felt like I wanted sewing up all over. I took a pretty stiff horn, which made me feel much better. But I was so tired that I could hardly work my jaws to eat. In the morning, myself and a young man started and brought in the first buck I had killed, and after breakfast we went and brought in the last one. The boat then started, but we again went and got the two I had killed just as I turned down the river in the evening and we then pushed on and overtook the boat, leaving the other two hanging in the woods, as we now had as much as we wanted. We got up the river very well, but quite slowly, and we landed on the eleventh day at the place the load was to be delivered at. They here gave me their skiff, and myself and a young man by the name of Flavius Harris, who had determined to go and live with me, cut out down the river for my cabin which we reached safely enough. We turned in and cleared a field, and planted our corn, but it was so late in the spring we had no time to make rails, and therefore we put no fence around our field. There was no stock, however, nor anything else to disturb our corn, except the wild varmints, and the old serpent himself with a fence to help him couldn't keep them out. I made corn enough to do me, and during that spring I killed ten bears and a great abundance of deer. But in all this time we saw the face of no white person in that country, except Mr. Owen's family and a very few passengers who went out there looking at the country. Indians, though, were still plenty enough. Having laid by my crap, I went home, which was a distance of about a 150 miles. And when I got there, I was met by an order to attend a call session of our legislature. I attended it and served out my time and then returned and took my family and what little plunder I had, and moved to where I had built my cabin and made my crap. I gathered my corn, and then set out for my fall's hunt. This was in the last of October, 1822. I found bear very plenty, and indeed all sorts of game and wild varmints, except buffalo. There was none of them. I hunted on till Christmas, having supplied my family very well all along with wild meat, at which time my powder gave out, and I had none either to fire Christmas guns, which is very common in that country, or to hunt with. I had a brother-in-law who had now moved out and settled about six miles west of me, on the opposite side of Rutherford's Fork of the Obion River, and he had brought me a keg of powder, but I had never gotten it home. There had just been another of Noah's freshes, and the low grounds were flooded all over with water. I knowed the stream was at least a mile wide which I would have to cross, as the water was from hill to hill, and yet I determined to go on over in some way or other, so as to get my powder. I told this to my wife, and she immediately opposed it with all her might. 
I still insisted, telling her we had no powder for Christmas, and worse than all, we were out of meat. She said we had as well starve as for me to freeze to death or to get drowned, and one or the other was certain if I attempted to go. But I didn't believe the half of this, and so I took my woolen wrappers and a pair of moccasins and put them on, and tied up some dry clothes and a pair of shoes and stockings, and started but I didn't before know how much anybody could suffer and not die. This, and some of my other experiments in water, learned me something about it, and I therefore relate them. The snow was about four inches deep when I started, and when I got to the water, which was only about a quarter of a mile off, it looked like an ocean. I put in and waited on till I come to the channel, where I crossed that on a high log. I then took water again, having my gun and all my hunting tools along, and waited till I came to a deep slough that was wider than the river itself. I had crossed it often on a log, but behold, when I got there, no log was to be seen. I knowed of an island in this slough, and a sapling stood on it close to the side of that log, which was now entirely under water. I knowed further that the water was about eight or ten feet deep under the log, and I judged it to be about three feet deep over it. After studying a little what I should do, I determined to cut a forked sapling which stood near me so as to lodge it against the one that stood on the island, in which I succeeded very well. I then cut me a pole, and crawled along on my sapling till I got to the one it was lodged against, which was about six feet above the water. I then felt about with my pole till I found the log, which was just about as deep under the water as I had judged. I then crawled back and got my gun, which I had left at the stump of the sapling I had cut, and again made my way to the place of lodgment, and then climbed down the other sapling so as to get on the log. I then felt my way along with my feet, in the water about waist deep, but it was a mighty ticklish business. However, I got over and by this time I had very little feeling in my feet and legs, as I had been all the time in the water, except what time I was crossing the high log over the river and climbing my lodged sapling. I went but a short distance before I came to another slough, over which there was a log, but it was floating on the water. I thought I could walk it, and so I mounted on it, but when I had got about the middle of the deep water, somehow or somehow else, it turned over, and in I went up to my head. I waded out of this deep water and went ahead till I came to the high land, where I stopped to pull off my wet clothes and put on the others which I had held up with my gun above the water when I fell in. I got them on, but my flesh had no feeling in it, I was so cold. I tied up the wet ones and hung them on a bush. I now thought I would run so as to warm myself a little but I couldn't raise a trot for some time. Indeed, I couldn't step more than half the length of my foot. After a while, I got better, and went on five miles to the house of my brother-in-law, having not even smelt fire from the time I started. I got there late in the evening, and he was much astonished at seeing me at such a time. I stayed all night, and the next morning was most piercing cold, and so they persuaded me not to go home that day. I agreed and turned out and killed him too dear. But the weather still got worse and colder instead of better. I stayed that night, and in the morning they still insisted I couldn't get home. I knowed the water would be frozen over, but not hard enough to bear me, and so I agreed to stay that day. I went out hunting again and pursued a big he-bear all day, but didn't kill him. The next morning was bitter cold, but I knowed my family was without meat, and I determined to get home to them, or die a trying. I took my keg of powder and all my hunting tools and cut out. When I got to the water, it was a sheet of ice as far as I could see. I put on to it, but hadn't got far before it broke through with me. And so I took out my tomahawk and broke my way along before me, for a considerable distance. At last I got to where the ice would bear me, for a short distance, and I mounted on it and went ahead. But it soon broke in again, and I had to wait on till I came to my floating log. 
I found it so tight this time that I knowed it couldn't give me another fall, as it was frozen in with the ice. I crossed over it without much difficulty, and walked along till I got to my lodged sapling and my log under the water. The swiftness of the current prevented the water from freezing over it, and so I had to wade, just as I did when I crossed it before. When I got to my sapling, I left my gun and climbed out with my powder keg first, and then went back and got my gun. By this time I was nearly frozen to death, but I saw all along before me where the ice had been fresh broke, and I thought it must be a bear straggling about in the water. I, therefore, fresh primed my gun, and cold as I was, I was determined to make war on him if we met. But I followed the trail till it led me home, and I then found it had been made by my young man that lived with me, who had been sent by my distressed wife to see, if he could, what had become of me, for they all believed that I was dead. When I got home I wasn't quite dead, but mighty nigh it, but I had my powder, and that was what I went for. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Bulka. Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. Chapter Twelve. That night there fell a heavy rain, and it turned to a sleet. In the morning all hands turned out hunting. My young man and a brother-in-law, who had lately settled close by me, went down the river to hunt for turkeys, but I was for larger game. I told them I had dreamed the night before of having a hard fight with a big black nigger, and I knowed it was a sign that I was to have a battle with a bear, for in a bear country I never knowed such a dream to fail. So I started to go up above the hurricane, determined to have a bear. I had two pretty good dogs and an old hound, all of which I took along. I had gone about six miles up the river, and it was then about four miles across to the main Obion. So I determined to strike across to that, as I had found nothing yet to kill. I got on to the river and turned down it, but the sleet was still getting worse and worse. The bushes were all bent down and locked together with ice, so that it was almost impossible to get along. In a little time my dogs started a large gang of old turkey gobblers, and I killed two of them of the biggest sort. I shouldered them up and moved on, until I got through the hurricane, when I was so tired that I laid my gobblers down to rest, as they were confounded heavy, and I was mighty tired. While I was resting, my old hound went to a log and smelt it a while, and then raised his eyes toward the sky and cried out. Away he went, and my other dogs with him, and I shouldered up my turkeys again and followed on as hard as I could drive. They were soon out of sight, and in a very little time I heard them begin to bark. When I got to them, they were barking up a tree, but there was no game there. I concluded it had been a turkey and that it had flew away. When they saw me coming, away they went again, and after a little time began to bark as before. When I got near them, I found they were barking up the wrong tree again, as there was no game there. They served me in this way three or four times until I was so infernal mad that I determined, if I could get near enough, to shoot the old hound at least. With this intention I pushed on the harder, till I came to the edge of an open parara, and, looking before my dogs, I saw in and about the biggest bear that ever was seen in America. He looked, at the distance he was from me, like a large black bull. My dogs were afraid to attack him, and that was the reason they had stopped so often, that I might overtake them. They were now almost up with him, and I took my gobblers from my back and hung them up in a sapling, and broke like a quarter horse after my bear, for the sight of him had put new springs in me. I soon got near to them, but they were just getting into a roaring thicket, and so I couldn't run through it, but had to pick my way along, and had close work even at that. In a little time I saw the bear climbing up a large black oak tree, and I crawled on till I got within about eighty yards of him. He was setting with his breast to me, 
and so I put fresh priming in my gun and fired at him. At this he raised one of his paws and snorted loudly. I loaded again as quick as I could, and fired as near the same place in his breast as possible. At the crack of my gun, here he came tumbling down, and the moment he touched the ground, I heard one of my best dogs cry out. I took out my tomahawk in one hand and my big butcher knife in the other, and run up within four or five paces of him, at which he let my dog go, and fixed his eyes on me. I got back in all sorts of a hurry, for I knowed if he got hold of me he would hug me altogether too close for comfort. I went to my gun and hastily loaded her again, and shot him the third time, which killed him good. I now began to think about getting him home but I didn't know how far it was. So I left him and started, and in order to find him again I would blaze a sapling every little distance which would show me the way back. I continued this till I got within about a mile of home, for there I knowed very well where I was, and that I could easily find the way back to my blazes. When I got home I took my brother-in-law and my young man and four horses and went back. We got there just before dark, and struck up a fire and commenced butchering my bear. It was some time in the night before we finished it, and I can assert, on my honor, that I believe he would have weighed six hundred pounds. It was the second largest I ever saw. I killed one a few years after that weighed six hundred and seventeen pounds. I now felt fully compensated for my sufferings in going after my powder and well satisfied that a dog might sometimes be doing a good business even when he seemed to be barking up the wrong tree. We got our meat home, and I had the pleasure to know that we now had plenty, and that of the best, and I continued through the winter to supply my family abundantly with bear meat and venison from the woods. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Bunn of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. • Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett. • Chapter Thirteen. I had on hand a great many skins, and so, in the month of February, I packed a horse with them, and taking my eldest son along with me, cut out for a little town called Jackson, situated about forty miles off. We got there well enough, and I sold my skins, and bought me some coffee, and sugar, powder, lead, and salt. I packed them all up in readiness for a start, which I intended to make early the next morning. Morning came. But I concluded, before I started, I would go and take a horn with some of my old fellow soldiers that I had met with at Jackson. I did so, and while we were engaged in this, I met with three candidates for the legislature, a Dr. Butler, who was by marriage a nephew to General Jackson, a Major Lynn, and a Mr. McEver, all first-rate men. We all took a horn together, and some person present said to me, Crockett, you must offer for the legislature. I told him I lived at least forty miles from any white settlement, and had no thought of becoming a candidate at that time. So we all parted, and I and my little boy went on home. It was about a week or two after this that a man came to my house and told me I was a candidate. I told him not so. But he took out a newspaper from his pocket and showed me where I was announced. I said to my wife that this was all a burlesque on me but I was determined to make it cost the man who had put it there at least the value of the printing, and of the fun he wanted at my expense. So I hired a young man to work in my place on my farm, and turned out myself electioneering. I hadn't been out long before I found the people began to talk very much about the bear hunter, the man from the cane, and the three gentlemen, who I have already named, soon found it necessary to enter into an agreement to have a sort of caucus at their march court to determine which of them was the strongest, and the other two was to withdraw and support him. As the court came on, each one of them spread himself to secure the nomination, but it fell on Dr. Butler, and the rest backed out. The doctor was a clever fellow, and I have often said he was the most talented man I ever run against for any office. 
his being related to General Jackson also helped him on very much. But I was in for it, and I was determined to push ahead and go through or stick. Their meeting was held in Madison County, which was the strongest in the representative district, which was composed of eleven counties, and they seemed bent on having the member from there. At this time Colonel Alexander was a candidate for Congress, and attending one of his public meetings one day, I walked to where he was treating the people, and he gave me an introduction to several of his acquaintances and informed them that I was out electioneering. In a little time my competitor, Dr. Butler, came along. He passed by without noticing me, and I suppose, indeed, he did not recognize me. But I hailed him, as I was for all sorts of fun, and when he turned to me I said to him, Well, doctor, I suppose they have weighed you out to me, but I should like to know why they fixed your election for March instead of August. This is, said I, a brand fire new way of doing business if a caucus is to make a representative for the people. He now discovered who I was, and cried out, Damn it, Crockett, is that you? Be sure it is, said I, but I don't want it understood that I have come electioneering. I've just crept out of the cane to see what discoveries I could make among the white folks. I told him that when I set out electioneering, I would go prepared to put every man on as good footing when I left him as I found him on. I would therefore have me a large buckskin hunting shirt made, with a couple of pockets holding about a peck each, and that in one I would carry a great big twist of tobacco, and in the other my bottle of liquor, for I knowed when I met a man and offered him a dram, he would throw out his quid of tobacco to take one, and after he had taken his horn, I would out with my twist and give him another chaw, and in this way he would not be worse off than when I found him, and I would be sure to leave him in a first-rate good humor. He said I could beat him electioneering all hollow. I told him I would give him better evidence of that before August, notwithstanding he had many advantages over me, and particularly in the way of money. But I told him that I would go on the products of the country, that I had industrious children, and the best of coon dogs, and they would hunt every night till midnight to support my election, and when the coon fur wa'n't good, I would myself go a-wolfing, and shoot down a wolf, and skin his head, and his scalp would be good to me for three dollars in our state treasury money, and in this way I would get along on the big string. He stood like he was both amused and astonished, and the whole crowd was in a roar of laughter. From this place I returned home, leaving the people in a first-rate way, and I was sure I would do a good business among them. At any rate, I was determined to stand up to my lick log, salt or no salt. In a short time there came out two other candidates, a Mr. Shaw and a Mr. Brown. We all ran the race through, and when the election was over it turned out that I beat them all by a majority of 247 votes, and was again returned as a member of the legislature from a new region of the country without losing a session. This reminded me of the old saying, a fool for luck? and a poor man for children. I now served two years in that body from my new district, which was the years 1823 and 24. At the session of 1823 I had a small trial of my independence, and whether I would forsake principle for party, or for the purpose of following after big men. The term of Colonel John Williams had expired, who was a senator in Congress from the state of Tennessee. He was a candidate for another election, and was opposed by Pleasant M. Miller, Esquire, who, it was believed, would not be able to beat the colonel. Some two or three others were spoken of, but it was at last concluded that the only man who could beat him was the present government, General Jackson. So a few days before the election was to come on, he was sent for to come and run for the Senate. He was then in nomination for the presidency, but sure enough he came, and did run as the opponent of Colonel Williams, and beat him too, but not by my vote. The vote was for Jackson, 35, for Williams, 25. I thought the Colonel had honestly discharged his duty, and even the mighty name of Jackson couldn't make me vote against him. But voting against the old chief was found a mighty uphill business to all of them except myself. I never would, nor never did, acknowledge I had voted wrong and I am more certain now that I was right than ever. I told the people it was the best vote I ever gave, that I had supported the public interest, and cleared my conscience in giving it, instead of gratifying the private ambition of a man. 
I let the people know as early as then that I wouldn't take a collar around my neck with the letters engraved on it, my dog, Andrew Jackson. During these two sessions of the legislature, nothing else turned up which I think it worthwhile to mention, and indeed I am fearful that I am too particular about many small matters. But if so, my apology is that I want the world to understand my true history and how I worked along to rise from a cane break to my present station in life. Colonel Alexander was the representative in Congress of the district I lived in, and his vote on the tariff law of 1824 gave a mighty heap of dissatisfaction to his people. They therefore began to talk pretty strong of running me for Congress against him. At last I was called on by a good many to be a candidate. I told the people I couldn't stand that. It was a step above my knowledge, and I'd knowed nothing about Congress matters. However, I was obliged to agree to run, and myself and two other gentlemen came out. But Providence was a little against two of us this hunt, for it was the year that Cotton brought $25 a hundred, and so Colonel Alexander would get up and tell the people it was all the good effect of this tariff law that it had raised the price of their cotton, and that it would raise the price of everything else they made to sell. I might as well have sung psalms over a dead horse as to try to make the people believe otherwise, for they knowed their cotton had raised sure enough, and if the colonel hadn't done it, they didn't know what had. So he rather made a mash of me this time, as he beat me exactly two votes, as they counted the polls, though I have always believed that many other things had been as fairly done as that same count. He went on and served out his term, and at the end of it Cotton was down to six or eight dollars a hundred again, and I concluded I would try him once more, and see how it would go with Cotton at the common price, and so I became a candidate. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Majors Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett Chapter 14 but the reader, I expect, would have no objection to know a little about my employment during the two years while my competitor was in Congress. In this space I had some pretty tough times, and will relate some few things that happened to me. So here goes, as the boy said when he run by himself. In the fall of 1825, I concluded I would build two large boats and load them with pipe staves for market. So I went down to the lake, which was about 25 miles from where I lived, and hired some hands to assist me, and went to work, some at boat building, and others to getting staves. I worked on with my hands till the bears got fat, and then I turned out to hunting, to lay in a supply of meat. I soon killed and salted down as many as were necessary for my family. But about this time, one of my old neighbors who had settled down on the lake about 25 miles from me, came to my house and told me he wanted me to go down and kill some bears about in his parts. He said they were extremely fat and very plenty. I know that when they were fat, they were easily taken, for a fat bear can't run fast or long. But I asked the bear no favors, no way, further than civility, for I now had eight large dogs and as fierce as painters, so that a bear stood no chance at all to get away from them. So I went home with him and then went on down towards the Mississippi and commenced hunting. We were out two weeks and in that time killed 15 bears. Having now supplied my friend with plenty of meat, I engaged occasionally again with my hands in our boat building and getting staves. But I at length couldn't stand it any longer without another hunt. So I concluded to take my little son and cross over the lake and take a hunt there. We got over and that evening turned out and killed three bears in little or no time. The next morning we drove up Four Forks and made a sort of scaffold on which we salted up our meat so as to have it out of the reach of the wolves for as soon as we would leave our camp they would take possession. 
We had just eat our breakfast when a company of hunters came to our camp, who had fourteen dogs, but all so poor, that when they would bark, they would almost have to lean up against a tree and take a rest. I told them their dogs couldn't run and smell of a bear, and they had better stay at my camp and feed them on the bones I had cut out of my meat. I left them there and cut out, but I hadn't gone far when my dogs took a first-rate start after a very large fat old he-bear, which run right plumb towards my camp. I pursued on, but my other hunters had heard my dogs coming and met them, and killed the bear before I got up with him. I gave him to them and cut out again for a creek called Big Clover, which wasn't very far off. Just as I got there and was entering a cane break, my dogs all broke and went ahead, and in a little time they raised a fuss in the cane and seemed to be going every way. I listened a while and found my dogs was in two companies and that both was in a snorting fight. I sent my little son to one, and I broke for the t'other. I got to mine first, and found my dogs had a two-year-old bear down, a woolen away on him. So I just took out my big butcher, and went up and slapped it into him, and killed him without shooting. There was five of the dogs in my company. In a short time, I heard my little son fire at his bear. When I went to him, he had killed it too. He had two dogs in his team. Just at this moment, we heard my other dog barking a short distance off, and all the rest immediately broke to him. We pushed on, too, and when we got there, we found he had still a larger bear than either of them we had killed treed by himself. We killed that one also, which made three we had killed in less than half an hour. We turned in and butchered them, and then started to hunt for water, and a good place to camp. But we had no sooner started than our dogs took a start after another one, and away they went like a thunder gust and was out of hearing in a minute. We followed the way they had gone for some time, but at length we gave up the hope of finding them and turned back. As we were going back, I came to where a poor fellow was grubbing, and he looked like the very picture of hard times. I asked him what he was doing away there in the woods by himself. He said he was grubbing for a man who intended to settle there, and the reason why he did it was that he had no meat for his family and he was working for a little. I was mighty sorry for the poor fellow, for it was not only a hard but a very slow way to get meat for a hungry family. So I told him if he would go with me, I would give him more meat than he could get by grubbing in a month. I intended to supply him with meat and also to get him to assist my little boy in packing in and salting up my bears. He had never seen a bear killed in his life. I told him I had six killed then and my dogs were hard after another. He went off to his little cabin, which was a short distance in the brush, and his wife was very anxious he should go with me. So we started and went to where I had left my three bears and made a camp. We then gathered my meat and salted and scaffolded it as I had done the other. Night now came on, but no word from my dogs yet. I afterwards found they had treed the bear about five miles off, near to a man's house, and had barked at it the whole enduring night. Poor fellows! Many a time they looked for me and wondered why I didn't come, for they knowed there was no mistake in me, and I knowed they were as good as ever flooded. In the morning, as soon as it was light enough to see, the man took his gun and went to them and shot the bear and killed it. My dogs, however, wouldn't have anything to say to this stranger, so they left him and came early in the morning back to me. We got our breakfast and cut out again, and we killed four large and very fat bears that day. We hunted out the week, and in that time we killed seventeen all of them first rate. When we closed our hunt, I gave the man over a thousand weight of fine fat bear meat, which pleased him mightily and made him feel as rich as a Jew. I saw him the next fall, and he told me he had plenty of meat to do him the whole year from his week's hunt. My son and me now went home. This was the week between Christmas and New Year that we made this hunt. When I got home, 
one of my neighbors was out of meat and wanted me to go back and let him go with me to take another hunt. I couldn't refuse, but I told him I was afraid the bear had taken a house by that time, for after they get very fat in the fall and early part of the winter, they go into their holes in large hollow trees or in the hollow logs or in their cane houses or the hurricanes and lie there till spring like frozen snakes. And one thing about this will seem mighty strange to many people. From about the 1st of January to about the last of April, these varmints lie in their holes altogether. In all that time, they have no food to eat, and yet, when they come out, they are not an ounce lighter than when they went to house. I don't know the cause of this, and still I know it is a fact, and I leave it for others who have more learning than myself to account for it. They have not a particle of food with them, but they just lie and suck the bottom of their paw all the time. I have killed many of them in their trees, which enables me to speak positively on this subject. However, my neighbor, whose name was McDaniel, and my little son and me, went on down to the lake to my second camp, where I had killed my seventeen bears the week before and turned out to hunt but we hunted hard all day without getting a single start. We had carried but little provisions with us, and the next morning was entirely out of meat. I sent my son about three miles off to the house of an old friend to get some. The old gentleman was much pleased to hear I was hunting in those parts, for the year before the bears had killed a great many of his hogs. He was that day killing his bacon hogs, and so he gave my son some meat and sent word to me that I must come into his house that evening, that he would have plenty of feed for my dogs and some accommodations for ourselves. But before my son got back, we had gone out hunting, and in a large cane break my dogs found a big bear in a cane house, which he had fixed for his winter quarters, as they sometimes do. When my lead dog found him and raised the yell, all the rest broke to him, but none of them entered his house until we got up. I encouraged my dogs, and they knowed me so well that I could have made them seize the old serpent himself with all his horns and heads and cloven foot and ugliness into the bargain if he would only have come to light so that they could have seen him. They bulged in, and in an instant the bear followed them out, and I told my friend to shoot him as he was mighty wrathy to kill a bear. He did so and killed him prime. We carried him to our camp, by which time my son had returned, and after we got our dinners we packed up and cut for the house of my old friend, whose name was Davidson. We got there and stayed with him that night, and the next morning, having salted up our meat, we left it with him and started to take a hunt between the Obion Lake and the Redfoot Lake, as there had been a dreadful hurricane which passed between them and I was sure there must be a heap of bears in the fallen timber. We had gone about five miles without seeing any sign at all, but at length we got on some high caney ridges, and, as we rode along, I saw a hole in a large black oak, and on examining more closely, I discovered that a bear had clomb the tree. I could see his tracks going up, but none coming down, and so I was sure he was in there. A person who is acquainted with bear hunting can tell easy enough when the varmint is in the hollow, for as they go up they don't slip a bit, but as they come down they make long scratches with their nails. My friend was a little ahead of me, but I called him back and told him there was a bear in that tree and I must have him out. So we lit from our horses and I found a small tree which I thought I could fall so as to lodge against my bear tree and we fell to work chopping it with our tomahawks. I intended, when we lodged the tree against the other, to let my little son go up and look into the hole, for he could climb like a squirrel. We had chopped on a little time and stopped to rest, when I heard my dogs barking mighty severe at some distance from us, and I told my friend I knew they had a bear, for it is the nature of a dog, when he finds you are hunting bears, to hunt for nothing else. He becomes fond of the meat and considers other game as not worth a notice, as old Johnson said of the devil. We concluded to leave our tree a bit and went to my dogs 
and when we got there, sure enough, they had an eternal great big fat bear up a tree, just ready for shooting. My friend again petitioned me for liberty to shoot this one also. I had a little rather not, as the bear was so big, but I couldn't refuse, and so he blazed away, and down came the old fellow like some great log and fell. I now missed one of my dogs, the same that I before spoke of as having treed the bear by himself some time before when I had started the three in the cane break. I told my friend that my missing dog had a bear somewhere, just as sure as fate, so I left them to butcher the one we had just killed, and I went up on a piece of high ground to listen for my dog. I heard him barking with all his might some distance off, and I pushed ahead for him. My other dogs, hearing him, broke to him. And when I got there, sure enough again, he had another bear ready treed. If he hadn't, I wish I may be shot. I fired on him and brought him down, and then went back and helped finish butchering the one at which I had left my friend. We then packed both to our tree where we had left my boy. By this time, the little fellow had cut the tree down that we intended to lodge, but it fell the wrong way. He had then feathered in on the big tree to cut that, and had found that it was nothing but a shell on the outside and all doted in the middle, as too many of our big men are these days, having only an outside appearance. My friend and my son cut away on it, and I went off about a hundred yards with my dogs to keep them from running under the tree when it should fall. On looking back at the hole, I saw the bear's head out of it, looking down at them as they were cutting. I hollered to them to look up, and they did so, and McDaniel catched up his gun, but by this time the bear was out and coming down the tree. He fired at it, and as soon as it touched ground, the dogs were all around it, and they had a rolling tumble fight to the foot of the hill where they stopped him. I ran up, and putting my gun against the bear, fired and killed him. We now had three, and so we made our scaffold and salted them up. End of chapter 14. Recording by Todd Majors. Chapter 15 of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Majors. Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett Chapter 15 In the morning I left my son at the camp, and we started on towards the hurricane. And when we had went about a mile, we started a very large bear, but we got along mighty slow on account of the cracks in the earth occasioned by the earthquakes. We, however, made out to keep in hearing of the dogs for about three miles, and then we came to the hurricane. Here we had to quit our horses, as old Nick himself couldn't have got through it without sneaking it along in the form that he put on to make a fool of our old grandmother Eve. By this time, several of my dogs had got tired and come back, but we went ahead on foot for some little time in the hurricane when we met a bear coming straight at us and not more than 20 or 30 yards off. I started my tired dogs after him, and McDaniel pursued them, and I went on to where my other dogs were. I had seen the track of the bear they were after, and I knowed he was a screamer. I followed on to about the middle of the hurricane, but my dogs pursued him so close that they made him climb an old stump about 20 feet high. I got in shooting distance of him and fired, but I was all over in such a flutter from fatigue and running that I couldn't hold steady. But, however, I broke his shoulder and he fell. I run up and loaded my gun as quick as possible and shot him again and killed him. When I went to take out my knife to butcher him, I found I had lost it in coming through the hurricane. The vines and briars were so thick I would sometimes have to get down and crawl like a varmint to get through at all and a vine had, as I supposed, caught in the handle and pulled it out. While I was standing and studying what to do, my friend came to me. 
He had followed my trail through the hurricane and had found my knife, which was mighty good news to me, as a hunter hates the worst in the world to lose a good dog or any part of his hunting tools. I now left McDaniel to butcher the bear, and I went after our horses and brought them as near as the nature of case would allow. I then took our bags and went back to where he was, and when we had skinned the bear, we fleeced off the fat and carried it to our horses at several loads. We then packed it up on our horses and had a heavy pack of it on each one. We now started and went on till about sunset when I concluded we must be near our camp. So I hollered and my son answered me, and we moved on in the direction to the camp. We had gone but a little way when I heard my dogs make a warm start again, and I jumped down from my horse and gave him up to my friend and told him I would follow them. He went on to the camp, and I went ahead after my dogs with all my might for a considerable distance, till at last night came on. The woods were very rough and hilly and all covered over with cane. I now was compelled to move on more slowly and was frequently falling over logs and into the cracks made by the earthquakes so that I was very much afraid I would break my gun. However, I went on about three miles when I came to a good big creek, which I waited. It was very cold, and the creek was about knee-deep, but I felt no great inconvenience from it just then, as I was all over wet with sweat from running, and I felt hot enough. After I got over this creek and out of the cane, which was very thick on all our creeks, I listened for my dogs. I found they had either treed or brought the bear to a stop, as they continued barking in the same place. I pushed on as near in the direction to the noise as I could, till I found the hill was too steep for me to climb, and so I backed and went down the creek some distance till I came to a hollow, and then took up that till I come to a place where I could climb up the hill. It was mighty dark, and was difficult to see my way or anything else. When I got up the hill, I found I had passed the dogs, and so I turned and went to them. I found, when I got there, they had treed the bear in a large forked poplar, and it was setting in the fork. I could see the lump, but not plain enough to shoot with any certainty, as there was no moonlight, and so I set into hunting for some dry brush to make me a light, but I could find none, though I could find that the ground was torn mightily to pieces by the cracks. At last I thought I could shoot by guess and kill him, so I pointed as near the lump as I could and fired away. But the bear didn't come, he only clomb up higher and got out on a limb, which helped me to see him better. I now loaded up again and fired, but this time he didn't move at all. I commenced loading for a third time, but the first thing I knew, the bear was down among my dogs and they were fighting all around me. I had my big butcher in my belt and I had a pair of dressed buckskin breeches on. So I took out my knife and stood, determined, if he should get a hold of me, to defend myself in the best way I could. I stood there for some time and could now and then see a white dog I had, but the rest of them and the bear, which were dark colored, I couldn't see at all. It was so miserable dark. They still fought around me, and sometimes within three feet of me, but at last the bear got down into one of the cracks that the earthquakes had made in the ground about four feet deep, and I could tell the biting end of him by the hollering of my dogs. So I took my gun and pushed the muzzle of it about, till I thought I had it against the main part of his body and fired. But it happened to be only the fleshy part of his foreleg, with this, he jumped out of the crack, and he and the dogs had another hard fight around me, as before. At last, however, they forced him back into the crack again, as he was when I had shot. I had laid down my gun in the dark, and I now began to hunt for it, and, while hunting, I got hold of a pole, and I concluded I would punch him a while with that. I did so, and when I would punch him, the dogs would jump in on him when he would bite them badly, and they would jump out again. I concluded, as he would take punching so patiently, it might be that he would lie still enough for me to get down in the crack and feel slowly along till I could find the right place 
to give him a dig with my butcher. So I got down, and my dogs got in before him and kept his head towards them, till I got along easily up to him, and placing my hand on his rump, felt for his shoulder, just behind which I intended to stick him. I made a lunge with my long knife and fortunately stuck him right through the heart, at which he just sank down, and I crawled out in a hurry. In a little time, my dogs all come out too, and seemed satisfied, which was the way they always had of telling me that they had finished him. I suffered very much that night with cold, as my leather breeches and everything else I had on was wet and frozen. But I managed to get my bear out of this crack after several hard trials, and so I butchered him and laid down to try to sleep. But my fire was very bad, and I couldn't find anything that would burn well to make it any better, and I concluded I should freeze if I didn't warm myself in some way by exercise. So I got up and hollered a while, and then I would just jump up and down with all my might and throw myself into all sorts of motions. But all this wouldn't do, for my blood was now getting cold and the chills coming all over me. I was so tired, too, that I could hardly walk, but I thought I would do the best I could to save my life, and then, if I died, nobody would be to blame. So I went to a tree about two feet through and not a limb on it for thirty feet, and I would climb up it to the limbs and then lock my arms together around it and slide down to the bottom again. This would make the insides of my legs and arms feel mighty warm and good. I continued this till daylight in the morning, and how often I clomb up my tree and slid down I don't know, but I reckon at least a hundred times. In the morning I got my bear hung up so as to be safe and then set out to hunt for my camp. I found it after a while, and McDaniel and my son were very much rejoiced to see me get back, for they were about to give me up for lost. We got our breakfasts, and then secured our meat by building a high scaffold and covering it over. We had no fear of its spoiling, for the weather was so cold that it couldn't. We now started after my other bear, which had caused me so much trouble and suffering. And before we got him, we got a start after another and took him also. We went on to the creek I had crossed the night before and camped, and then went to where my bear was that I had killed in the crack. When we examined the place, McDaniel said he wouldn't have gone into it, as I did, for all the bears in the woods. We took the meat down to our camp and salted it, and also the last one we had killed, intending in the morning to make a hunt in the hurricane again. We prepared for resting that night, and I can assure the reader I was in need of it. We had laid down by our fire, and about ten o'clock there came a most terrible earthquake, which shook the earth so that we were rocked about like we had been in a cradle. We were very much alarmed, for though we were accustomed to feel earthquakes, we were now right in the region which had been torn to pieces by them in 1812, and we thought it might take a notion and swallow us up, like the big fish did Jonah. In the morning we packed up and moved to the hurricane, where we made another camp, and turned out that evening and killed a very large bear, which made eight we had now killed in this hunt. The next morning we ended the hurricane again, and in little or no time my dogs were in full cry. We pursued them, and soon came to a thick cane break, in which they had stopped their bear. We got up close to him, as the cane was so thick that we couldn't see more than a few feet. Here I made my friend hold the cane a little open with his gun till I shot the bear, which was a mighty large one. I killed him dead in his tracks. We got him out and butchered him, and in a little time started another and killed him, which now made ten we had killed, and we knowed we couldn't pack any more home as we had only five horses along. Therefore we returned to the camp and salted up all our meat, to be ready for a start homeward next morning. The morning came, and we packed our horses with the meat, and had as much as they could possibly carry, and sure enough, cut out for home. It was about thirty miles, and we reached home the second day. I had now accommodated my neighbor with meat enough to do him, and had killed in all, up to that time, fifty-eight bears during the fall and winter. 
As soon as the time come for them to quit their houses and come out again in the spring, I took a notion to hunt a little more, and in about one month I killed forty-seven more, which made one hundred and five bears I had killed in less than one year from that time. End of chapter 15 Recording by Todd Majors Chapter 16 of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Majors Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee By David Crockett Chapter 16 Having now closed my hunting for that winter, I returned to my hands, who were engaged about my boats and staves, and made ready for a trip down the river. I had two boats and about thirty thousand staves, and so I loaded with them and set out for New Orleans. I got out of the Obion River, in which I had loaded my boats very well, but when I got into the Mississippi, I found all my hands were bad scared, and in fact I believe I was scared a little the worst of any, for I had never been down the river, and I soon discovered that my pilot was as ignorant of the business as myself. I hadn't gone far before I had determined to lash the two boats together. We did so, but it made them so heavy and obstinate that it was next akin to impossible to do anything at all with them or to guide them right in the river. That evening we fell in company with some Ohio boats, and about night we tried to land, but we could not. The Ohio men hollered to us to go on and run all night. We took their advice, though we had a good deal rather not, but we couldn't do any other way. In a short distance we got into what is called the Devil's Elbow, and if any place in the wide creation has its own proper name, I thought it was this. Here we had about the hardest work that I ever was engaged in in my life to keep out of danger, and even then we were in it all the while. We twice attempted to land at Woodyards, which we could see, but couldn't reach. The people would run out with lights and try to instruct us how to get to shore, but all in vain. Our boats were so heavy that we couldn't take them much anyway, except the way they wanted to go, and just the way the current would carry them. At last we quit trying to land, and concluded just to go ahead as well as we could, for we found we couldn't do any better. Sometime in the night I was down in the cabin of one of the boats, sitting by the fire, thinking on what a hobble we had got into, and how much better bear hunting was on hard land than floating along the river, when a fellow had to go ahead whether he was exactly willing or not. The hatchway into the cabin came slap down right through the top of the boat, and it was the only way out except a small hole in the side which we had used for putting our arms through to dip up water before we lashed the boats together. We were now floating sideways, and the boat I was in was the hindmost as we went. All at once, I heard the hands begin to run over the top of the boat in great confusion, and pull with all their might, and the first thing I knowed after this, we went broadside full tilt against the head of an island where a large raft of drift timber had lodged. The nature of such a place would be, as everybody knows, to suck the boats down and turn them right under this raft, and the uppermost boat would, of course, be sucked down and go under first. As soon as we struck, I bulged for my hatchway as the boat was turning under sure enough. But when I got to it, the water was pouring through in a current as large as the hole would let it, and as strong as the weight of the river could force it. I found I couldn't get out here, for the boat was now turned down in such a way that it was steeper than a housetop. I now thought of the hole in the side and made my way in a hurry for that, with difficulty I got to it, and when I got there I found it was too small for me to get out by my own dower, 
and I began to think that I was in a worse box than ever. But I put my arms through and hollered as loud as I could roar, as the boat I was in hadn't yet quite filled with water up to my head, and the hands who were next to the raft, seeing my arms out and hearing me holler, seized them and began to pull. I told them I was sinking and to pull my arms off or force me through, for now I knowed well enough it was neck or nothing, come out or sink. By a violent effort they jerked me through, but I was in a pretty pickle when I got through. I had been sitting without any clothing over my shirt. This was torn off, and I was literally skinned like a rabbit. I was, however, well pleased to get out in any way, even without shirt or hide, as before I could straighten myself on the boat next to the raft, the one they pulled me out of went entirely under, and I have never seen it any more to this day. We all escaped onto the raft, where we were compelled to sit all night, about a mile from land on either side. Four of my company were bareheaded and three barefooted, and of that number I was one. I reckon I looked like a pretty crackling ever to get to Congress. We had now lost all our loading and every particle of our clothing except what little we had on. But over all this, while I was sitting there in the night, floating about on the drift, I felt happier and better off than I ever had in my life before. For I had just made such a marvelous escape that I had forgot almost everything else in that, and so I felt prime. In the morning about sunrise, we saw a boat coming down and we hailed her. They sent a large skiff and took us all on board and carried us down as far as Memphis. Here I met with a friend that I never can forget as long as I am able to go ahead at anything. It was a Major Winchester, a merchant of that place. He let us all have hats and shoes and some little money to go upon, and so we all parted. A young man and myself concluded to go on down to Natchez to see if we could hear anything of our boats, for we supposed they would float out from the raft and keep on down the river. We got on a boat at Memphis that was going down and so cut out. Our largest boat, we were informed, had been seen about 50 miles below where we stove, and an attempt had been made to land her, but without success, as she was as hard-headed as ever. This was the last of my boats, and of my boating, for it went so badly with me, along at the first, that I hadn't much mind to try it any more. I now returned home again, and as the next August was the congressional election, I began to turn my attention a little to that matter, as it was beginning to be talked of a good deal among the people. End of chapter 16 Recording by Todd Majors Chapter 17 of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Majors Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett Chapter 17 I have heretofore informed the reader that I had determined to run this race to see what effect the price of cotton could have again on it. I now had Colonel Alexander to run against once more, and also General William Arnold. I had difficulties enough to fight against this time, as everyone will suppose, for I had no money and a very bad prospect, so far as I knowed, of getting any to help me along. I had, however, a good friend who sent for me to come and see him. I went, and he was good enough to offer me some money to help me out. I borrowed as much as I thought I needed at the start and went ahead. My friend also had a good deal of business about over the district at the different courts, and if he now and then slipped in a good word for me, it is nobody's business. We frequently met at different places, and, as he thought I needed, he would occasionally hand me a little more cash. 
so I was able to buy a little of the creature to put my friends in a good humor as well as the other gentlemen, for they all treat in that country. Not to get elected, of course, for that would be against the law, but just, as I before said, to make themselves and their friends feel they're keeping a little. Nobody ever did know how I got money to get along on till after the election was over and I had beat my competitors 2,748 votes. Even the price of cotton couldn't save my friend Alec this time. My rich friend, who had been so good to me in the way of money, now sent for me and loaned me a hundred dollars and told me to go ahead, that that amount would bear my expenses to Congress and I must then shift for myself. I came on to Washington and drawed two hundred and fifty dollars and purchased with it a check on the bank at Nashville and enclosed it to my friend. And I may say, in truth, I sent this money with a mighty good will, for I reckon nobody in this world loves a friend better than me or remembers a kindness longer. I have now given the close of the election, but I have skipped entirely over the canvas, of which I will say a very few things in this place, as I know very well how to tell the truth, but not much about placing them in book order so as to please critics. Colonel Alexander was a very clever fellow and principal surveyor at that time, so much for one of the men I had to run against. My other competitor was a major general in the militia and an attorney general at the law, and quite a smart, clever man also. And so it will be seen I had war work as well as law trick to stand up under. Taking both together, they make a pretty considerable of a load for any one man to carry. But for war claims, I consider myself behind no man except the government, and mighty little, if any, behind him. But this the people will have to determine hereafter, as I reckon it won't do to quit the work of reform and retrenchment yet for a spell. But my two competitors seemed some little afraid of the influence of each other, but not to think of me in their way at all. They, therefore, were generally working against each other, while I was going ahead for myself and mixing among the people in the best way I could. I was as cunning as a little red fox and wouldn't risk my tail in a committal trap. I found the sign was good almost everywhere I went. On one occasion, while we were in the eastern counties of the district, it happened that we all had to make a speech, and it fell on me to make the first one. I did so after my manner, and it turned pretty much on the old saying, a short horse is soon curried, as I spoke not very long. Colonel Alexander followed me, and then General Arnold come on. The general took much pains to reply to Alexander, but didn't so much as let on that there was any such candidate as myself at all. He had been speaking for a considerable time when a large flock of guinea fowls came very near to where he was and set up the most unmerciful chattering that ever was heard, for they are a noisy little brute anyway. They so confused the general that he made a stop and requested that they might be driven away. I let him finish his speech, and then walking up to him, said aloud, Well, Colonel, you are the first man I ever saw that understood the language of fowls. I told him that he had not had the politeness to name me in his speech, and that when my little friends, the guinea fowls, had come up and began to holler, Crockett, 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 he had been ungenerous enough to stop and drive them all away. This raised a universal shout among the people for me and the general seemed mighty bad plagued. But he got more plagued than this at the polls in August, as I have stated before. This election was in 1827, and I can say, on my conscience, that I was, without disguise, the friend and supporter of General Jackson upon his principles as he laid them down and as I understood them before his election as president. During my two first sessions in Congress, Mr. Adams was president, and I worked along with what was called the Jackson Party pretty well. I was re-elected to Congress in 1829 by an overwhelming majority, and soon after the commencement of this second term, I saw, or thought I did, 
that it was expected of me that I was to bow to the name of Andrew Jackson and follow him in all his motions and minings and turnings, even at the expense of my conscience and judgment. Such a thing was new to me and a total stranger to my principles. I knowed well enough, though, that if I didn't hurrah for his name, the hue and cry was to be raised against me, and I was to be sacrificed if possible. His famous, or rather I should say his infamous, Indian bill was brought forward, and I opposed it from the purest motives in the world. Several of my colleagues got around me and told me how well they loved me and that I was ruining myself. They said this was a favorite measure of the president, and I ought to go for it. I told them I believed it was a wicked, unjust measure, and that I should go against it, let the cost to myself be what it might, that I was willing to go with General Jackson in everything that I believed was honest and right, but, further than this, I wouldn't go for him or any other man in the whole creation, that I would sooner be honestly and politically damned than hypocritically immortalized. I had been elected by a majority of 3,585 votes, and I believe they were honest men and wouldn't want me to vote for any unjust notion, to please Jackson or anyone else. At any rate, I was of age and was determined to trust them. I voted against this Indian bill, and my conscience yet tells me that I gave a good, honest vote, and one that I believe will not make me ashamed in the day of judgment. I served out my term, and though many amusing things happened, I am not disposed to swell my narrative by inserting them. When it closed and I returned home, I found the storm had raised against me sure enough, and it was echoed from side to side and from end to end of my district that I had turned against Jackson. This was considered the unpardonable sin. I was hunted down like a wild varmint, and in this hunt every little newspaper in the district and every little pin-hooked lawyer was engaged. Indeed, they were ready to print any and everything that the ingenuity of man could invent against me. Each editor was furnished with the journals of Congress from headquarters and hunted out every vote I had missed in four sessions, whether from sickness or not, no matter, and each one was charged against me at eight dollars. In all, I had missed about 70 votes, which they made amount to $560, and they contended I had swindled the government out of this sum as I had received my pay, as other members do. I was now again a candidate in 1830, while all the attempts were making against me, and every one of these little papers kept up a constant war on me, fighting with every scurrilous report they could catch. Overall, I should have been elected, if it hadn't been that but a few weeks before the election, the little fourpence halfpenny limbs of the law fell on a plan to defeat me, which had the desired effect. They agreed to spread out over the district and make appointments for me to speak, almost everywhere, to clear up the Jackson question. They would give me no notice of these appointments, and the people would meet in great crowds to hear what excuse Crockett had to make for quitting Jackson. But instead of Crockett's being there, this small fry of lawyers would be there, with their saddlebags full of the little newspapers and their journals of Congress, and would get up and speak and read their scurrilous attacks on me, and would then tell the people that I was afraid to attend, and in this way would turn many against me. All this intrigue was kept a profound secret from me till it was too late to counteract it, and when the election came, I had a majority in 17 counties putting all their votes together, but the 18th beat me, and so I was left out of Congress during those two years. The people of my district were induced by these tricks to take a stay on me for that time, but they have since found out that they were imposed on, and on reconsidering my case have reversed that decision which, as the Dutchman said, is a fair ding as ever was." When I last declared myself a candidate, I knew that the district would be divided by the legislature before the election would come on, and I moreover knew that from the geographical situation of the country, the county of Madison, which was very strong, 
and which was the county that had given the majority that had beat me in the former race, should be left off from my district. But when the legislature met, as I have been informed, and I have no doubt of the fact, Mr. Fitzgerald, my competitor, went up and informed his friends in that body that if Madison County was left off, he wouldn't run, for that Crockett could beat Jackson himself in those parts in any way they could fix it. The liberal legislature, you know, of course, gave him that county, and it is too clear to admit of dispute that it was done to make a mash of me. In order to make my district in this way, they had to form the southern district of a string of counties around three sides of mine, or very nearly so. Had my old district been properly divided, it would have made two nice ones in convenient nice form. But, as it is, they are certainly the most unreasonably laid off of any in the state, or perhaps in the nation, or even in the teetotal creation. However, when the election came on, the people of the district, and of Madison County among the rest, seemed disposed to prove to Mr. Fitzgerald and the Jackson legislature that they were not to be transferred like hogs and horses and cattle in the market, and they determined that I shouldn't be broke down, though I had to carry Jackson and the enemies of the bank and the legislative works all at once. I had Mr. Fitzgerald, it is true, for my open competitor, but he was helped along by all his little lawyers again, headed by old Blackhawk, as he is sometimes called, alias Adam Huntsman, with all his talents for writing chronicles and such like foolish stuff. But one good thing was, and I must record it, the papers in the district were now beginning to say, fair play a little, and they would publish on both sides of the question. The contest was a warm one, and the battle well fought, but I gained the day, and the Jackson horse was left a little behind. When the polls were compared, it turned out I had beat Fitz just 202 votes, having made a mash of all their intrigues. After all this, the reader will perceive that I am now here in Congress, this 28th day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,834, and that, what is more agreeable to my feelings as a freeman, I am at liberty to vote as my conscience and judgment dictates to be right, without the yoke of any party on me or the driver at my heels, with his whip in hand commanding me to gi wo just at his pleasure. Look at my arms, you will find no party handcuff on them. Look at my neck, you will not find there any collar with the engraving, My Dog, Andrew Jackson. But you will find me standing up to my rack as the people's faithful representative and the public's most obedient, very humble servant, David Crockett. End of chapter 17. Recording by Todd Majors. End of Narrative of the Life of David Crockett of the State of Tennessee by David Crockett.